Thank you very much. That concludes questions on the statement by Mr McKee. The next item of business is a stage one debate on motion 21834 in the name of Ash Denham on the Children's Scotland Bill. Uh, can I remind members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on Ash Denham to speak to and move the motion. Governor, sir. Thank you, Presiding Officer, for the opportunity to address the Chamber today on the general principles of the Children's Scotland Bill. And I am delighted to open the debate on this bill. I am grateful to the Justice Committee for its careful scrutiny of the bill, and I welcome its recommendations to approve the bill's general principles. And I'm also grateful to the organisations and to all the individuals who have given evidence to the Justice Committee. Um, but I'd firstly like to mention the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on family relationships. And I'm assuming that many of us uh, will have received correspondence from worried grandparents, from parents and other family members at this time. And the Chamber will appreciate that it can be extremely difficult for parents to work out what is in the best interests of their child. So I'm grateful that the Lord President um, has issued guidance on, uh, and that he's published that on compliance. And we've also published information on the Parent Club website aimed at helping parents to make informed decisions. And I think the most important message is that if anyone is concerned about risk of harm to their child at any time, they should contact their local authority, social work department, or the police on 101 or 999 if they think the child is in immediate danger. Um, and I'll now move on to the Children's Scotland Bill. I receive, I'm sure like many of us, a lot of correspondence in relation to family court proceedings, and I appreciate that this can be a difficult and often a stressful time for all involved, especially for the child who is at the heart of this case. And civil law often doesn't take centre stage. Um, it's quite often overshadowed, and yet it can and it does have very profound implications for those who are involved, especially in the family courts. So the bill follows on from a consultation of the review of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 by the Scottish Government in 2018. And the Children's Scotland Act is the key legislation on contact, residence and parental responsibilities and rights. The consultation um, specifically sought the views of children and young people and we received um, 300 uh, questionnaire responses from children and the views um, of those children and young people from those questionnaires have guided the development of this bill. So the main aim of the bill, I will. Alex Colhamilton. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way. Does she recognise that in that consultation, children overwhelmingly supported the right of children to have meaningful relationships with grandparents and other ancestors? Does she also recognise that the French have actually passed law where children have a guaranteed right to uh, sustain a relationship with an ancestor if, they, if it is appropriate for them to do so? And does she recognise the groundswell of opinion in Scotland, not least from my constituents, Gordon and Sean and Marie Mason, who are estranged beyond their control from their uh, grandson, who they've not seen since he was an infant? who would very much like to see a similar right afforded to children in Scotland. Minister Lashton. I'm grateful to the member for raising this issue. And uh, the member will, of course, recall that I met with him and his constituents um, so that I could hear uh, firsthand from them about um, this issue. And I do think the member highlights the very important role that, that grandparents do play in a child's life. And for this reason, in the Family Justice and Modernisation Strategy, I have committed to further promotion of the Charter for Grandchildren. Um, I have considered this issue very carefully, but I am of the view that an automatic right of contact um, is not appropriate for a number of, of key reasons. Um, I did consider this um, issue very carefully, and I think that um, contact with grandparents, an automatic right to have that contact with grandparents, would have um, substantially the same implications as an automatic right for a grandparent to have contact with their grandchildren. And the reasons for this is that if that was to be the case, it would cut across um, the general provisions of this bill in which the interests of the child are the most important thing. And for that reason, I, I don't think that it is appropriate um, to include it in the bill. However, um, in the checklist of factors that are included in the bill, there is one um, where the court must take into account um, the uh, relationships that are important to the child. 
and grandparents um, are envisaged as being one of those. So I hope the member would be reassured by that. Um, so the main aims of the bill are to ensure that the interest of children at the very heart of the family justice modernisation and to ensure that the views of the child are heard. And in particular, I think the provisions of the bill are a step forward in ensuring that the child's best interests are at the centre of all contact and residence cases, that they ensure that the views of the child are heard, that they further protect victims of domestic abuse and their children in family court proceedings, and further compliance with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and ensure that relationships between brothers and sisters are promoted for children in care. I will. Neil Finlay. Take an intervention. Um, she mentions brothers and sisters. The Justice Committee's recommendations on the bill included the ask that the word practical, practicable <coughs> be removed from Section 10, uh, promotion of contact between looked after children. During the or oral evidence, uh, Celsius agreed that the word should be removed um, and that it was very important in overcoming systematic failure to maintain and pri prioritise the relationships between brothers and sisters in care. Um, so far, the government has been resistant to that move. Could I urge the Minister to uh, take up their suggestion and will she consider that again? Minister Ashton. So, uh, the relationship between siblings um, is very important and we really want to see these duties being implemented in practice. Um, and we will continue to work with local authorities um, to understand if there are any barriers to doing that. And I, I do take the member's point about the inclusion of the word practicable, um, and it's in there specifically just to give uh, flexibility where required to local authorities, because there are a number of instances, I'm sure the member will accept, where it is um, not going to be practical in order to carry out that relationship. It may be that the sibling um, hasn't been in care, and you can't force someone to have a relationship with someone if they don't want to do that. So that's why it's there, it's, um, and it's intended, um, I think, only to be used in a very limited number of occasions. So I've responded to the recommendations raised by the Justice Committee in their Stage 1 report, and the bill is only one part of the work on reforming the family courts, and some work is better done by secondary legislation or by guidance. And this is set out in the Family Justice Modernisation Strategy, which was published alongside the bill in September last year. And I'd like to mention four areas in particular. So firstly, ensuring that children are able to participate in decisions affecting them. So I'm aware of concerns from stakeholders that the views of younger children are not being heard in family court cases. And I welcome the recently published research by Dr. Fiona Morrison and Professor Kay Tisdall on children's participation in family actions. And the bill removes the legal presumption that a child aged 12 or over is mature enough to give their views in various situations. I believe that the majority of children are able to express their views. However, there will be circumstances involving um, extremely young children or children perhaps that have severe learning difficulties uh, where they're not able to form a view. And the legislation does require options for these exceptional circumstances. But again, we would accept, um, expect these exceptions to be used just infrequently. But I do appreciate the concerns from stakeholders and also from the Justice Committee that the bill should be strengthened to make clear that the starting point should be that all children are capable of forming a view. And of course, um, if a child does not want to give their views, um, I would not expect them to be made to do so. I will. Jamie Green. Uh, thanks to the Minister for the intervention, and apologies, I'm not on this committee, so I haven't followed it all the way through, but c can the Minister just explain uh, what has been done to address the issue that if all children are treated equally in, in a different way from the current legislation, how you will address the issue of coercion or children, especially younger children, who may feel under pressure by one parent uh, to have a particular view or say something particular? What, what safeguards are there to ensure that all children can, can uh, express their views freely without undue pressure? Minister Ashton. So that is part of what the bill does. The bill is um, attempting to give all children um, an, uh, an opportunity to express their views um, in a way that's suitable to them. And um, in doing so, um, we are regulating um, child welfare reporters. So that is um, a key way in which a child might be supported um, and able to give their views 
And we're also going to set up um, a system of training um, for child welfare reporters, and we would expect them to be trained in issues such as um, coercive control and spotting unhealthy family dynamics and so on, um, so that um, those professionals um, are able to support the children in order to give their views, as the member says, um, apart from any pressure of, of the, uh, the exactly the type that he mentions. So um, I appreciate the concerns um, that the stakeholders had raised about strengthening the bill in that area, and I propose to bring forward an amendment at stage two of the bill um, to strengthen the provisions, and this is in sections um, one to three of the bill, to avoid, as far as possible, the risk of the capacity uh, exemption being used excessively by decision makers. And I also uh, propose to bring forward an amendment at stage two to clarify that when the court is investigating the reasons for non-compliance with the court order, they should seek the views of the child concerned. So the bill states that the decision maker must give the child the opportunity to express their views in a manner suitable to them. And one of the aspects of the guidance for parties and courts that I've committed to in the family justice modernization strategy will be to publish information on the ways in which a child can give their views to the court. Um, I've also committed to producing a public paper in advance of stage three, outlining the ways that children can be supported to give their views to decision makers. And I think it's very important that when a child has given their views to the court, that the reasons for the decision which the court makes are then explained to the child in a clear and an impartial way. And for this reason, the bill ensures that the outcome and the reasons for them are explained to the child. Um, we wouldn't expect all decisions to be explained. Um, many of these are procedural in nature, but we would expect the important decisions to be explained. Secondly, I understand that a number of stakeholders have suggested the bill should include provision around child support workers. Uh, this was also raised in the Justice Committee um, in its stage one report. Um, child support workers, I think, could play a very useful role in supporting children to give their views when they're, say, completing a form or if they were speaking to a child welfare reporter or to a sheriff. But I think we would need to ensure minimum standards of training and experience are set out in legislation to ensure consistency of approach and that the best interests of the child are maintained. And further work is needed on this to ensure a joined up approach so that any provisions would work with ex existing support and advocacy systems and also other proposed Scottish Government work. When the bill was introduced, I published a family justice and modernisation strategy which sets out work for secondary legislation um, on guidance or work which requires further consideration. And one action in the strategy is to consider the role of support workers further. And the paper outlining the ways that children can be supported to give their views to decision makers that I referred to earlier in my opening remarks will look further at child support workers. And thirdly, I'd like to briefly focus on the regulation of child welfare reporters. And I'm aware that this has also been raised in the stage one evidence session and also in the Justice Committee's report. And I recognise that the child welfare reporters can play an important role in ensuring that the best interests of the child are reported to the court. And the bill establishes a register of child welfare reporters and it also gives them two new functions, explaining decisions and also investigating reasons for non-compliance with an order. And the full details of training requirements will be laid out in secondary legislation and we will consult fully on those requirements in due course. And I'm aware that children and young people who've spoken to a child welfare reporter would have their views on training and experience. So I will also ensure that children and young people are fully involved in this consultation process. At the moment, about 90% of child welfare reporters are lawyers. And one of the aims of the bill is to encourage more non-lawyers um, such as child psychologists or social workers to become uh, child welfare reporters. And in, our um, in my response to the stage one report, I've committed to setting out before the first stage two session how we propose to encourage other professionals to become child welfare reporters. And I think it's important to note that this list of child welfare reporters um, is maintained at a national level. Um, a centralised list will ensure consistency of approach across Scotland um, in terms of appointments, um, handling complaints and so on. And it would also ensure there's consistency across the country in how the child welfare reporters on the list are um, appointed in order to undertake those reports. And I would envisage that where possible, um, a local child welfare reporter would be appointed. Um, I'd just like to mention promotion of contact between looked after children and their siblings. So in March, Ms Todd, the Minister for Children and Young People, announced that she wished to put 
looked after a child's contact with their brothers and sisters on the same legal footing as their contact with their parents, where this is practical and appropriate, and the bill at Section 10 aims to do that. And I'd just like to briefly touch on the implementation of the bill. If the bill is passed, I will commit to proceeding with implementation as quickly as possible. However, there are certain aspects of the bill that will take time. Um, it's important that areas such as the child welfare reporters, curators, ad litem, accommodation standards and training and requirements for contact centres and their staff, that there's full and proper consultation. So other areas that can be progressed more quickly, I will do so. And of course, implementation tasks for this bill will need to be reviewed in the light, of course, at the moment of the COVID-19 situation. So in conclusion, pres presiding officer, I believe that the bill is an important step forward in improving the family courts. And during the consultation um, and development of this bill, um, the voice of young people, a theme came through very strongly, and it was that no one is listening to me and no one is listening to what I want. And this bill aims to change that. So I commend the general principles of this bill to Parliament and I move that Parliament agrees to support the general principles of the Children Scotland Bill. Thank you very much, Minister. And I now call Margaret Mitchell to speak for the Justice Committee. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity as the convener of the Justice Committee to speak in the Children's Scotland Bill Stage 1 debate and to thank all those organisations and individuals who gave evidence. While this evidence taking predated the pandemic, many of the issues in the bill, including the functioning of our family courts, access to child contact centres, and arrangements between separated parents have been severely impacted by the virus. I also want to thank the committee members, not just for their work scrutinising the bill, but for the very constructive way in which they've helped finalise our stage one report during lockdown. And here, the entire committee wants to put on record its gratitude and thanks to the Justice Clarking team who had to complete and have the report agreed remotely by correspondence in these very difficult circumstances. The bill amends the Children's Scotland Act 1995 and seeks to do four things. To ensure the views of the child are heard in contact and residence, and residence cases, to further protect victims of domestic abuse and their children, to ensure the best interests of the child are at the very centre of contact and residence cases, and that children's hearings uh, and, uh, and children's hearings. To further compliance with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in Family Court Cases. And overall, the committee considers the bill is a positive step forward in achieving these policy aims. The committee considers it is an important principle that the views of the child or young person should, wherever possible, be heard in court and taken into account in the decisions that affect them, and that a 12-year-old child is no more able to express a view than a child one day short of his or her 12th birthday. However, consistent evidence presented confirmed that the current age presumption has meant that in practice, the views of younger children are not routinely heard. The committee therefore welcomes the Scottish government's response that it will bring forward amendments at stage two to strengthen the provision in sections one to three of the bill to try and avoid the risk of the capacity exemption being used excessively by decision makers. Deputy Presiding Officer, the bill and legislation, le legislative change alone will not be enough to ensure the voice of the child or young person is heard. The allocation of sufficient resources and proper processes to ask children how they wish to express their views will also be required. Will the Minister therefore address the powerful evidence presented that the infrastructure for taking children's views needs to be strengthened 
and the necessary resources put in place. Scotland's network of family mediation and contact centres are primarily operated by Relationship Scotland. They play a pivotal role during family breakups, providing mediation services between separated couples and enabling these separated parents, the one who is separated, to save their child or children. Given this, the committee considers that child contact centres must operate to high standards with a fully trained workforce. We therefore welcome and support provisions in the bill which would regulate these centres. However, at present it is clear from the evidence the committee heard that there, is, there are significant concerns about the impact of regulation on the ability of contact centres to continue to operate. And in stark terms, without sufficient resources being provided to help contact centres upgrade and adapt, some may close. The committee therefore welcomes the Scottish Government's commitment to tell it before stage two how much additional resource will be made available to Relationship Scotland to take them through to the end of the financial year and to move them forward to a sustainable, a sustainable funding model in the long term. Furthermore, it would be helpful if in her summing up, the Minister would explain why she and her officials are not able to give the committee the response to the findings of the care inspector on how contact centres should be regulated. Additionally, the committee recommended that the bill should be amended to ensure that all referrals are made to a regulated contact centre. Given this has been rejected in favour of issuing guidance only, would the minister explain why this approach is favoured, and if this means some contacts may be revealed elsewhere, potentially to unregulated bodies. The committee makes a number of other recommendations aimed at improving both the law and practice relating to disputes over children. These include the factors that a court should take into account when considering a child's welfare. And it's fair to say this part of the bill attracted little judicial support. Prior to the 1995 Act, these matters were left to the judiciary. In 2006, two factors that the judiciary should take into account were introduced. And now this bill proposes the addition of two more factors. And the committee considers that it's necessary to go one step further and expand the list of factors in Section 12 to include those suggested by the UN Commission uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child. This recommendation has not been agreed to, and it would again be helpful if the Minister would explain why. Quite simply, given the Scottish Government intends to bring forward a bill to incorporate the UN's BRC into Scots law, it seems sensible to incorporate relevant rights into the bill now. The bill also regulates child welfare reporters who, through their reports, have an important role in forming the courts. The committee made a series of recommendations here, and whilst the minister has agreed to some of these, would she provide some detail uh, regarding how she intends to ensure that child welfare reporters are appropriately trained and fairly reimbursed, and how she will diversify the pool from which reporters are currently drawn. Deputy Presiding Officer, witnesses told the committee that courts are rare, rarely the best place for resolving family disputes, and that mediation and early resolution helps prevent people becoming entrenched in their positions and reduces trauma. Merely signposting people to mediation will not be enough to convince a set of parents to even find out more about this option. The committee therefore, as it has done previously, unanimously recommends that mandatory mediation in information meetings should be piloted with an exception for domestic abuse cases. 
Would the Minister address why this recommendation was rejected and will she acknowledge that lack of legal aid is one of the barriers to greater use of ADAR and explain why no progress on this has been made since the committee published its alternative dispute resolution report in 2018. Coming now to the important issue of access by grandparents to their grandchildren. It is a sad fact that many grandparents can lose contact with their grandchildren when parents separate. And the committee heard calls from some groups for grandparents access rights. At present, no such presumption appears in the bill. And despite the 2006 Charter for Grandchildren, members heard that this has not been effective in improving contact between grandchildren and grandparents. The committee therefore welcomes the Minister's commitment that she will do more to help promote this Charter and see it used more in practice. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, members will speak to other issues including some of the terminology in the bill, shared parenting, court delays, sibling contact, and appropriate and proportionate confidentiality being maintained for children and young people. These are issues which will re-emerge at stage two. In the meantime, the committee has much pleasure in supporting the general principles of the Children's Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Liam Kerr. Deputy Presiding Officer, I remind the Chamber in advance that I'm a practising solicitor holding certificates with the Law Societies of England and Wales and Scotland. In opening this debate on the Children's Scotland Bill, I confirm that we will vote in favour of the principles of this bill. The policy aims are to ensure the views of the child are heard in contact and residence cases, protect victims of domestic abuse and their children, Ensure the best interests of the child are at the centre of contact and residence cases and note the terminology as this is something I want to return to later and compliance with the UNCRC. We agree with the convener that the bill is a positive step forward in achieving these policy aims. And before continuing, it is important on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives to express thanks to those who made this happen. The clerks to the committee in particular ensured a comprehensive briefing throughout and have produced a report which literally and metaphorically should carry an awful lot of weight. And secondly, to those who gave evidence, both written and orally, and who have continued to provide information since the Stage 1 report. During one of our sessions, John Finney, MSP, spoke, I think, for all of us, when he said, in response to what was extraordinary testimony from Oisin King of Who Cares Scotland, it means much more than the reams of paper that we have in front of us to hear directly from someone like you. That was extremely helpful. And he was right. The, the power of evidence given by the witnesses certainly helped remind me of the deep responsibility that we all share to get this right. And what has emerged is a report that I hope the committee is proud of and in which all contributors feel like they've been listened to. Its conclusions and the committee's thoughts are clear and the convener has obviously gone through the key conclusions uh, but I would like to focus my thoughts around some areas that I, in my view merit further thought and consideration at stage two. The first is around confidentiality. The children first have just given us a submission which I think summarizes the point well. They say that the children share matters involving quote family support domestic abuse and trauma recovery and include very personal information the child has shared in the context of a safe and trusting environment with a support worker. In evidence, they and the likes of Scottish Women's Aid argued that the bill should include a specific provision along the lines of one which was consulted on in 2018, i.e. the court, when deciding whether confidential information should be disclosed to a party asking for it, should only do so where it is in the best interest of the child and after the child's views have been considered. They were supported by the young people from Yellow, who said it would be right that where a child provides views, for example, to a child welfare reporter, that a child's permission should be required before sharing. And I can see that argument. But I also heard the evidence from the likes of Professor Sutherland and the Faculty of Advocates. They argued that this could infringe parents' rights under Article 6 of the ECHR and that legislating would be difficult given the balancing act required. Now, 
I believe that guidance either will be issued or has been issued in this regard pursuant to the family justice modernization strategy, but I'm personally sympathetic to the arguments around confidentiality, albeit well aware of the challenges, so I hope this is something that we can all explore further at stage two. And on that balancing act, during committee I explored section 16, which deals with the situation where a person has breached a court order and there would be a duty now to establish the reasons for that failure. I listened to very carefully to the various children's organisations who welcomed the provision, although, for example, Children First and NSPCC Scotland noted importantly that they'd hope any court orders would be satisfactory in the first place. However, I also heard the faculty say that courts already do consider the reasons for non-compliance. Ruth Innes QC said, if a court is going to find somebody in contempt of court, it will have had to investigate the reasons for that. Sheriffs and judges already carry out such investigations. We do not see how the provision would add to what courts currently do. Lady Wise stated, currently in those proceedings, there is always an opportunity for the party who is said to be in breach of the order to respond. And then the Sheriffs Association suggested that Section 16 could encourage parties to try to reopen issues that had already been determined by the court and thus prevent uh, a robust approach to enforcement, whilst the Senators of the College of Justice suggested it could encourage people to disobey a court order. Tellingly, Jennifer Gallagher of the Family Law Association said, Section 16 does not add anything. And I get to a point where it feels as though Section 16 might more properly be amended out as it feels unnecessary and potentially detrimental and I hope to hear as this debate, debate develops and perhaps I will now reasons why I might revise that view. Rona Mackay. The member for taking intervention. Um, does the member agree that um, section 16 um, can um, provide a safeguard for parents who are protecting their children from domestic abuse and that can be a very good reason why um, you know failure to, to attend is, is, uh, is carried out. Liam Kerr. Yeah, I thank uh, the member for the intervention. I, d I do agree. I, I think that's a very important point. I'm grateful to you for, for raising it. I think the, the, the balancing act, the, the evidence that we heard leads me to a point where I say perhaps section 16 is not the most effective way to deal with this. What is, I'm very keen to hear uh, because I do think that is a, a good point well made. Uh, now, I cannot contribute without referring to Section 10 of the Bill, which relates to looked-after children. Section 10 provides that a local authority must take such steps to promote, on a regular basis, personal relations and contact between siblings as appear to be both practicable and appropriate. Now, the context to this was the extraordinary testimony, which I referred to earlier, when Oshin King told us he had looked after his sister since he was seven and since she was six months, uh, a total period of five years. Now, he said... When I was taken into the care system, I was separated from my sister. We did not see each other again until 18 months later. I took the separation as a loss. It was something like a death. It was extraordinarily powerful testimony. And Neil Finlay brought this up in an intervention earlier, highlighting what Celsius said. And he will know that the committee heard from Duncan Dunlop of Who Cares Scotland, who told us that the word practicable as a caveat to section 10 should not be there. And Dr. Hill of Celsus stated the caveat could be interpreted in such a way that it was used to inhibit children's rights to see their brothers and sisters. Stand up for siblings provided written evidence to explain, saying there was a risk of conflating whether contract, contact is appropriate and practicable, and went on to say that without the removal of practicable, there is a high risk that decisions will continue to be led by resourcing issues and the proposed legal changes will be ineffective. Now, listening carefully, yes, Mr. Finlay. Uh, Neil Findlay. Yeah, I would encourage the, the Minister maybe to just to listen to this part because I think given what Liam Kerr seems to be saying, um, I don't want to speak for any other parties, but it would appear that there's a number of people in here who want to see that removed. Would the Minister meet with Liam Kerr and I and others who are interested to discuss how we might take that out? Uh, the Minister is not on her feet speaking just now. If Mr Kerr would like to stand up and take an intervention from the Minister, that would be acceptable and I can give you extra time. Liam Kerr. Grateful. Um, I will take an intervention from the Minister. Um, I would like Minister. to reassure uh, the member that, of course, I am listening to everything that is um, being said in this debate and I'm making careful notes on it. And also, you will, of course, notice that the Minister for Children is sitting directly behind me. So Minister, um, you're intervening on Mr Kerr. 
You can always rely on Mr. Finlay to I get us all too. confused, can you? He comes into <laughs> Um, I would, of course, be happy to meet with uh, both the members in order to discuss this issue further. Right, get back to Mr Kerr. Uh, I'd be very grateful for that, and I'm grateful to both members for the interventions, um, because the point is well made, uh, and, and I want to develop it very slightly, um, because Stand Up for Siblings, Clan Child Law and Celsius actually went on on this point to say that the, the financial memorandum doesn't set out the cost implications for local authorities in implementing this duty. Now, in committee, the, the minister will remember, I, I questioned her as to whether, without additional resources, it would in any event be possible to give effect to this duty in practice. And her view in the committee was that this practice should already be happening and therefore is cost neutral. Now, leaving aside that I hope the, the data uh, to back that up will be forthcoming, I pressed her on the use of the word should, because I worry if it's not happening, then logically there will be costs in compliance and therefore these should be budgeted for in the financial memorandum. Or this will offer a reason for non-compliance if the resources are not there. The Minister's reply at the time was brief. She said simply, will I have time? Thank you. Ash Denham. I, I just wanted to make the point to the member that um, the care review report, which was titled Follow the Money, um, does provide reassurance that there is that money in the system. And in fact, this year's local government settlement um, by the Scottish government, um, there's provisions for 400 million pounds, and that's just in the area for children, social work. Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful. It doesn't change the fact there is nothing in this financial memorandum, and I think my point remains well made. I, I think either this is happening, as the minister suggested in committee, or it should be happening, in which case, okay, let's get the data that says it is happening and therefore there's no cost implication of this, or it's not happening, in which case there is a potential cost implication, and this provides a reason for local authorities not to do it because it's not there. Uh, so as you've heard, presiding officer, I remain unpersuaded by this, and I think perhaps resource provision might be re-examined. I think the word practicable should probably be removed or a very bare minimum guide as, guidance be put forward that makes very clear what practicable means. But I do look forward to uh, meeting with the Minister and Neil Finlay to, to work on this further. The final point I wish to make is one that Fulton McGregor explored a couple of times and goes back to terminology. Courts have powers to make residence orders and contact orders to set out things like where children are to live, which parents they are to live with and which other family members they may have contact with. And by way of further example, section 10 refers to whether of the half-blood or of the whole blood. The suggestion is that these terms are somewhat loaded. Um, and indeed, chartered psychologist Dr. Sue Whitcomb told Mr. McGregor that she thought contact in particular is quite abhorrent. Megan Farr, representing the Children's Commissioner, felt the phrase about half-blood was not particularly helpful. Now, the Scottish Government consulted on, but didn't include within the bill, a proposal to update the terminology associated with these court orders. And several, several other countries have made changes to the terminology, including England and Wales, where they talk of child arrangement orders. I don't take a strong view yet, but members know I get very exercised about semantics and the, the power and precision of terminology. And if Fulton McGregor does choose to explore this point, he may find support forthcoming. Presiding officer, I came into this bill. Uh, no, I don't think we've got any more extra time for Mr Kerr. Perhaps you can contribute later, Mr Kerr. Presiding officer, I came into this bill from a standing start. I hadn't done anything in the family courts except some second-hand personal experience since the very start of my legal career some two decades ago. I come to this stage, having read the evidence and heard the witnesses steeled in my resolve to ensure that what results is the strongest bill possible. In its principles, this bill is the right start, and I look forward to working with colleagues across the chamber to improve it as best we can. Call James Kelly for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I start by thanking the Justice Committee clerks for putting this report together under very difficult circumstances, particularly towards the end when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started to start, started to impact proceedings and also the many witnesses who came to the committee personally and also submitted written evidence as already has been displayed in the chamber uh, there are a lot of issues at stake here uh, and people have strong and passionate views 
and the, uh, uh, the Justice Committee report has gone to great lengths to capture the different views and uh, different parameters uh, which require to be explored. And I think the reason that uh, people feel strongly about these issues is that uh, a young person's formative years are very important and to be in a position where they end up in a, a family court, perhaps uh, access to access being contested, uh, it can be very, very vulnerable for a young person. And it's important to ensure that they have the correct uh, protections and that they are properly looked after. And at the outset, uh, I say that that is what this uh, legislation seeks to achieve. However, I think it needs, in some areas, further discussion and improvement in order that we uh, do children the, the, the proper right in terms of looking after them in legislation. The, the legislation comes about uh, primarily because the 1995 uh, Children's Scotland Act needs, needs some improvement. Uh, it doesn't uh, primarily focus on the rights uh, of the child. Uh, it needs, as many witnesses pointed out, to give more protection to children who have been involved in, in homes where there's been domestic abuse and it needs improvement in, in relation to resolving parenting disputes. I think we also need to give regard to the United Nations Convention on Human Rights in terms of compliance with family court cases. In terms of the, one of the main promotions of the bill, which is uh, abolishing the pres presumption of the child's right to a view if they're, they're 12 plus. Uh, I think that objective is correct. Uh, it's unfair to isolate and to take out those who are under 12. It's logical that many young people uh, under, under that age would have a view and it's important that that view is, 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 and is expressed and comes to the fore. Uh, however, the way that the legislation has been drafted and seeking to take out the presumption of 12 plus and using the capacity of ex uh, exception could be interpreted as weakening uh, the right of the, the child to a view. So that is one area that requires uh, improvement. In terms of the welfare of the child, I think everyone would agree that children's welfare is absolutely critical and central to that is the relationships uh, that a child uh, has. And we've already had uh, quite a bit of discussion around looked after children, children in care. And it's clear from the interventions that Neil Finlay has made and also Liam Kerr that there are, there are two issues at stake here. There's what's in the legislation, uh, the use of the word practicable uh, is open to different interpretations and I think could be difficult in a legal setting. And I think the second point is the resources that are required, particularly for local authorities, to give proper support to uh, looked after children. So I think in moving into stage two, we need to produce correct legislation, but it also has to be, al be aligned to the definition of adequate financial resources for local authorities within the financial memorandum. Um, I think in terms of the, the issue around contact centres, which was raised in the convener's contribution, again, there's a, a real issue there around funding. I think everybody recognises the importance of contact centres in bringing uh, children together uh, with those that they have key relationships with. Um, but the, the withdrawal of the £750,000 funding from Relationship Scotland is, is something that's a, a real concern. I acknowledge that the government has uh, announced interim funding for the next quarter, but an organisation like Relationship Scotland, particularly operating uh, under the, the auspices of the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, needs more stability of funding. And I hope the Minister uh, can outline the, what the funding package is going to be in place over the next financial year and also ensure that that is adequate. Uh, I think another key issue that needs to, to be addressed is the, the, the breaching of court orders, uh, particularly contact orders. Clearly that is an, an absolutely unacceptable situation where 
uh, courts make decisions and individuals then uh, breach them. The legislation seeks to address this by introducing section 16 to provide more uh, clarity. Uh, as Liam Kerr has already noted, there was divided opinions on this in terms of the evidence and a lot of the children's organisations were sympathetic. The legal view was that uh, there, the, there was already uh, avenues been taken by the courts to address these issues. Um, I'm sympathetic to section 16 remaining. However, uh, I do believe that the government need to do, do some work uh, to make the case and perhaps improve section 16 uh, so that it's got a, a, a proper place and it's not just legislation for legislation's sake. Yes, I'll put an uh, Very quickly, because yeah. we have used a lot of time. Uh, Neil um, my constituent um, breached a, a court order in, in relation to uh, arrangements for access to the child because of the lack of health and safety within the contact centre. Um, does he agree that that is why a, a number of people want to see contact centres regulated? James Kelly. Uh, I think that's a very good point and the, uh, the committee took substantial evidence on contact centres and the importance for the right infrastructure around contact centres, ensuring that there's pr a proper health and safety and also the training of those who are working within the contact centres. So there are substantial... I think the thing about this debate is it's not just the legislation, it's the infrastructure. And I think if we're to, if we're to get this right, and summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, if we're to get this right going forward, we need to ensure that the, the legislation is amended to give proper protections to the child, to give clarity in the legal setting, but we also need to make sure that there's appropriate funding and infrastructure in place if we're really serious about uh, achieving the ambitions that this legislation sets out to try and achieve. Call John Finney, who's joining us remotely. Um, up to six minutes, please, Mr Finney. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. And I too would like to join with others in thanking all those who have contributed to getting us this far, those who responded to the consultation, our witnesses, particularly our uh, parking staff for the outstanding work they did in the organisations for their helpful briefings and indeed the Scottish Government for their response. And the Justice Committee welcomed the Scottish Government's commitment to the Family Justice Modernisation Strategy of which it is part and the child-centred approach based on rights and indeed we've seen in the criminal here uh, a move to the Barnhouse model where um, the intention is not that the process further traumatise those who are involved in it and I hope that this will be one of the consequences Touch on the word presumption here, the not unreasonable presumption that the government's job is to put in place legislation to protect the very vulnerable. And um, or as Scottish Women's Aid referred to, the government has an obligation to create a system that protects and upholds their rights. A presumption that there's a, a fair and equitable legislation that recognises competing interests. However, when we come to children, the presumption is the well being of the child is paramount. And I'd suggest that this applies too to the rights of the child and the views of the child. And the committee heard a lot of views and um, we all approached it with an open mind. My colleague Liam Kerr referred to some of the compelling testimony we heard. We also heard in private very compelling testimony from Yellow, the young expert group in the Improving Justice in Child Contact Project. And I'll read a quote from them, if I may. Um, Don't dismiss us. We experienced it and we know what we're talking about. If we feel like we weren't, aren't being listened to, it can make it make us not want to speak to people or take part in things. Um, the, the report talked about the, the real benefit of alternative dispute resolution and I think a view that no one wins if it gets a court setting and the potential to resolve disputes outside court um, is to be encouraged. The Justice Committee had previously I recommend that the Scottish Government and Scottish Legal Aid Board explore legal aid being available. And in our report, indeed, we expressed disappointment that that hadn't been uh, the case. However, um, we need to welcome the Scottish Government's response uh, to our report, where they said consideration will be given to the availability of funding from the Legal Aid Fund or other forms of ADR as part of this process. However, and other members have touched on this, as we know, where domestic violence is involved, mediation has no place. No sitting across the table from the perpetrator, allowing the potential for continued uh, trolling and coercive behaviour. 
And I welcome the Scottish Government's acknowledgement of that important point when they say that in relation to the Family Justice Modernisation Strategy Paper for the Family Law Committee, that they'll ensure that it's compliant with Istanbul Convention, which makes very clear that um, you, uh, the use of mandatory alternative dispute resolution process, including mediation and conciliation, in relation to all forms of violence covered by the Cultural Convention is appropriate. And we also heard on a number of occasions the, the challenges faced by victims um, and the different levels of protection that are afforded, both in the criminal court and then moving to the, the, the civil arena. Um, and the Justice Committee's recommendation on that has been accepted by the Scottish Government, and I welcome the ongoing work. Because there, there, there must be a change. We can't. The threat level doesn't change just because you change the, 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 the forum that uh, the participants are involved in. As a consequence, of course, children can and will suffer. The issue of contact centres has been mentioned, and, and as, um, as Mr Finlay said with Mr Kelly there, the, this has been the location where um, abuse has been allowed to continue and indeed intensify. So um, there must be a robust multi-agency risk assessment and, of course, adequate resources to, to um, uh, ameliorate the measures uh, that uh, these risk assessments highlight. There's nothing simple, and uh, uh, the one thing that is consistent throughout this is the paramount consideration that should be given to the well-being of the child. And the incorporation of the UN Charter writes a positive presumption, back to that word presumption, a positive presumption that all children should form a view. Um, the current presumption in the Children's Scotland Act, the 95 Act, um, that children are able to form a view from the age of 12, has created the practical situation in Scotland where the views of younger children are routinely not sought or listened to, and there was considerable support um, from what we heard for that, uh, the removal of that presumption in the, the bill. Um, NSPCC said, and I quote here, however, we do not support the exception which provides that a child's views do not have to be sought, quote, if the child is not capable of forming a view, with this being envisaged as potentially including very young children, and that is uh, an extract from the policy memorandum. So, Article 12 of the UNCRC um, has been found to require, to require that children are not required to, to prove their capacity, rather that all children are presumed to be capable of forming and expressing views. And um, NSPCC captured this very well, I think, when they said, the extent to which children are, quote, capable of forming a view is contingent on the capacity of the adult taking their view to understand the varied ways, including non-verbal, in which children express views. Um, trading officer, in the very limited time uh, left, um, I, I want to touch on the issue of uh, confidentiality and competing rights that other members have referred to there. The Children's Commission had in a certificate um, and uh, saying it sometimes, it refers to Article 8, saying it's sometimes necessary to interfere with the right in the best interest of the child. It's also sometimes to ensure that the party's right to fair file is realised. However, any such interference that is applied must be carefully considered and take account of their best interests and views. That isn't covered in the, the legislation at the moment, and I propose to take an amendment to address that. I'll conclude my remarks there. Any thanks. Thank you, Mr. Finney. Um, we now move on to Liam MacArthur, who, MacArthur, who's also joining us remotely, for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to take part, like John Finney, remotely in this stage one debate on the Children's Scotland Bill. Scottish Liberal Democrats strongly support the principles of this bill, um, but also recognise the work ahead of the Justice Committee and the Parliament more generally in making the improvements that will be necessary ahead of stage three. In that regard, like others, I'm grateful to all those who've helped uh, our scrutiny to date, the clerks, but particularly those uh, who provided evidence, some of it uh, extremely powerful and it's shone a light on the areas where further work is needed. The Minister has already indicated the Government's willingness to make changes at, uh, in Stage 2, including the removal of remaining presumptions against children expressing their views, and that is welcome. So let me uh, reflect on some of the other areas where I believe change and improvement uh, are similarly needed. As we know, in cases where relationship breakdown turns out to be difficult and traumatic, it's often the child or the children involved who pay the heaviest price. Ensuring their views are clearly heard in the process of determining what happens over contact and residence, as well as more generally, is therefore absolutely imperative. 
Further embedding UNCRC in our law through family court cases is also a step in the right direction ahead of the full incorporation promised by the First Minister. And additional protections for victims of domestic abuse is also a welcome aspect of this bill. Given these very worthwhile and laudable aims, it's worth emphasising at the outset how vital it will be for ministers to ensure that the provisions of this bill are properly resourced. Simply passing into, into law rights and duties may make us feel good as legislators, uh, but doing so without the necessary funding does a disservice to those whose interests we seek to protect and those working on the front line who we will be setting up to fail. One of the clearest examples relates to the regulation of contact centres, and here I declare an interest my wife is about to take up the role as Director of Relationship Scotland Orkney. I'll therefore leave it maybe to others to develop the arguments in this area, as colleagues already have. It's safe to say that, as the committee report points out, quote, the financial memorandum suggests there could be significant costs for contact centres in meeting the new regulatory requirements, yet no additional funding is proposed. Regulating contact centres is the right and responsible thing to do. But as the committee concluded, we shouldn't be passing legislation, quote, if it is not clear that there are sufficient means to fund the changes proposed. Another example where this appears to be a risk is in relation to child support workers. As our stage one report states, we had powerful evidence that the infrastructure for taking children's views needs to be strengthened. Without this, the bill may make very little difference in practice, particularly in relation to hearing the views of younger children where specific skills and more creative methods are required. Advocacy support in cases under Section 11 of the 95 Act, it's crucial uh, to ensuring every child has the best uh, chance of having their views heard. Not all would require such uh, support, but unless it's available, we risk potentially failing those most in need. Professor Tisdale and others expressed strong concerns about the absence of any infrastructure uh, for child advocacy in the bill, or indeed clarity in the family justice modernisation strategy. That's not good enough, and the bill must be amended to provide those assurances, and ministers should set out timescales for delivery. Of course, a child will only feel comfortable in expressing their views if they can do so in a manner that best suits them. Key also is building trust and confidence in the process. The committee heard arguments in favour of giving children more of a say over how their information can be shared with the courts. At present, it's possible for highly intimate information held by third sector organisations to be drawn into court proceedings, even if uh, sharing it goes against the interests of the child in question. This can happen without the child uh, even knowing. Both Children First and Scottish Women's Aid shared examples and evidence uh, that highlighted the potential for undermining the trust and confidence of children who engage with third party organisations. I recognise, as others have, the need to respect the rights of all those involved in court proceedings, but believe the bill provides a chance at least to clarify the guidance and the need for any information shared to be proportionate, necessary, and in consideration of the best interests of the child. Another area where this bill can go further is in promoting greater use of alternative dispute resolution. Whatever steps we take to improve the way in which evidence is taken, courts are the last place we should wish to see relationship disputes settled. There's a case for extending the scope of legal aid to encourage uh, more people to look at ADR, and I welcome the government's willingness to look at this. Finally, let me touch on the issue of access that children have to other members of their extended family. Some of the most powerful evidence we heard came in support of the need to do more to ensure children continue to have contact with their siblings, Oshin Kings uh, being an obvious example of that. Ensuring this happens when it is in the interest of each child involved can be resource intensive, but it should be prioritised so that it happens more consistently. The, con the committee also had compelling evidence on the part of grandparents who can often find themselves cut off from grandchildren as a result of an acrimonious separation or family dispute. I have great sympathy with the case they make. They are right to argue that grandparents and other adults, including those um, who may not have a blood uh, relationship with a child, often play a role in a child's life that is invaluable and enriching. That should be recognised and reflected where appropriate in the decisions that are made in the best interest of any child. However, ultimately, decisions still need to be made in the best interest of the child. Anything that talks in terms of the rights of others risks diluting that. Deputy Presiding Officer, Scottish Liberal Democrats will be uh, gladly supporting the principles of this bill at decision time, but recognise the work that lies ahead 
that it is to meet the needs of children and deliver its laudable aims. I look forward to playing a part in that process and once again thank those who have given the committee so much food for thought as we embark on our stage two consideration of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. We now move on to the open debate and it's speeches of six minutes, please. Um, we've used up the spare time on the opening debates. I don't want to cut the closing one, so if we could stick to time, that would be useful. Rona Mackay, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The bill we're debating today is an extremely important one, and I'll be happy to pass the principles at decision time. It's important on so many levels, but for me, there's one overriding reason. It finally gives children a voice within a justice system historically structured for adults. All children should be able to give their views and decisions which affect them and their future. There's a lot of detail in the bill affecting many areas of children's lives. And as Deputy Convener of the Committee, I'd like to also like to thank the clerks and the drafting team for their invaluable help. Their attention to detail and, the hard work allowed, and their hard work allowed the committee to agree the general principles in a largely non-contentious way. I'd also like to thank all the witnesses who gave their time to give us excellent evidence, either in person or by written submission. The policy aims of the bill are to ensure the views of the child are heard in contact and residence cases, further protect victims of domestic abuse and their children, ensure the best interests of the child in contact and residence cases, and ensure the compliance with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in Family Court Cases. A hugely important part of the bill, and one that was widely supported, is the removal of the existing presumption in the 1995 Act that only a child aged 12 or over is of sufficient age and maturity to form a view. We heard consistent evidence that this presumption has meant that the views of younger children who are perfectly able to express their views are not routinely heard in practice. As Megan Farr from the Children and Young People's Commissioner's Office, uh, Office Scotland said, children's views do not miraculously change the minute they turn 12, but their capacity to express their views evolves over time from birth. Excuse me, Ms Mackay. Minister, could you resume the front bench, please? Thank you. There's been some concern which I share that the phrase in the bill who are capable could be misinterpreted and lead to decision makers deciding a child does not have capacity to give their views. So I'm pleased that the Minister proposes to bring forward an amendment at stage two to strengthen the provisions in sections one to three and to avoid the risk of capacity exemption being used excessively. Presiding officer, section 15 of the bill places a duty on the court to explain the decisions of the on the court to explain decisions to children and this is where the role of child welfare reporters is crucial. The bill extends their role and ensures that they'll get appropriate training through secondary legislation. As more than 90% of child welfare reporters are lawyers, I'm pleased that more non-lawyers such as child psychologists will be encouraged to train and a nationally held register of reporters will be upheld to protect children's rights. However, the current adult-centred infrastructure does need to be strengthened and this is why the role of children's advocacy and support workers is vital. The Minister has said this will be considered in the Family Justice Modernisation Strategy and it will be looked at before Stage 3. And I believe that this is essential and I'm keen to see early progress of this. Presiding Officer, if children's views are to be heard, then a system of redress and complaint for them should be considered. This is particularly important in cases of domestic abuse, which is reported in the majority of contact cases in the civil court. Children must be heard without fear or retribution. And that's why confidentiality and the sharing of data must be proportional and not unduly shared by courts or those who have perpetrated abuse against the child. I don't believe the guidance here is enough and look forward to this being strengthened before stage three. Presiding officer, one area of enormous importance, as we've heard, is child contact centres for children and families. The committee strongly recommends regulation of these currently un unregulated centres run by paid staff and volunteers with sometimes minimal training. To be clear, this is not a reflection of the many excellent people who work there, but a reflection on the need to ensure that centres are safe for all who use them, no matter where they are in the country. During evidence, we heard harrowing evidence of children being made to attend under a court order, court contact order, often when they didn't want to, causing them great distress. They'd no say in the matter. As we've heard, the committee held a private meeting with youngsters from Yellow who had experienced have been ordered to attend these centres and their accounts were powerful and moving. In committee, I voiced my reservations about contact centres and their purpose. I agree with Women's Aid and Children's First when they say 
If contact is unsafe for women and children and contact needs to be supervised, it should not happen. I strongly support the government working with third sector partners such as Women's Aid and Children First to ensure that women, children uh, and young people who have experienced domestic abuse are protected. However, given this, that these centres are part of our current framework, I'm pleased that they're to be regulated, but agree there would need to be sufficient and secure, secure funding. Presenting officer, another important issue has been discussed today uh, and we heard about was sibling contact where appropriate and safe to do so. As mentioned by Liam Kerr and others, during one evidence session, we heard a powerful and moving account from a young care experienced man who was estranged from his sister and could only have structured and supervised contact with her, despite posing absolutely no risk. Allowing siblings contact would be an enormous step forward and entirely in line with the care review recommendations. Section 10 of the bill says that for looked after children, local authorities must promote personal relations and direct contact with siblings where appropriate. And I'd like to see this point strengthened at stage two, and I'd also like to meet with the minister. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I'd like to end with a quote from a young person from the Yellow Group who, who said, adults always seem to be given more priority than children, even though it's all supposed to be about the child. We hope that this bill can change that. Presiding officer, so do I. Please support the general principles of the bill. Thank you. Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Little people, as some call children, are no less people than adults. Nor are they less affected, and in many ways they can be more deeply affected than adults when the law and the courts become involved in their young and developing lives. Particularly at points in time when the family situation they find themselves in is unsettled and often contentious. It is important for us to always bear in mind that the law is never a fixed thing that develops and alters as time passes, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. And of course, this parliament is meant to deliberately and after careful consideration, change the law to improve it, or sometimes to correct its own past errors or those of others. The others may be thought to include judges, um, so I should not perhaps push that comment too far. Judges, after all, are there to seek to objectively and fairly apply the law as it is to the individual cases before them. So turning to the bill, as my colleagues do, I will support the bill in principle. But as always, cautious consideration is required of this bill and greater detail requiring scrutiny is likely to emerge at later stages. This is especially so in relation to those issues where it is intended uh, they will be addressed in secondary legislation. We should, of course, realize that judges already do include in their careful considerations views expressed by children in cases before them and also often explain very well their reasoning and thinking to them. The impetus the bill gives to see the courts obliged to do so is welcome, provided the justice system is properly resourced to enable judges to properly fulfill this function as part of their already very busy duties. And the question of resources has been raised already by a number of members here. The measures in the bill, as set out by my colleague Margaret Mitchell on behalf of the committee, deal with uh, important details in this area that they cover. I'll just make a few brief passing comments on some of these. The removal of the assumption of competence of children over 12 intended to encourage consideration of a child's testimony at a younger age. This should mean the court will feel enabled to exercise its judgment more freely in considering and acting upon the evidence of a child of any age. In a similar way to which a judge traditionally decided for younger years whether a child should be asked to either simply promise to tell the truth or to take an oath when giving evidence in a criminal trial. Statutory factors, which will now be specified in the bill, which will be there to add to and adjust those factors which must formally be taken into consideration when determining the outcome of any case, taking into account sibling relationships, relationships with each parent, and giving a broader consideration to relevant factors. 
statutorily basing this, uh, I think, should be thought to be a sensible step. The basis for the recruitment and operation of child welfare supporters is to be made more consistent, reforming a system which features several inconsistencies. The role, training, remuneration, and quality of people so employed would, one would at least hope, be improved by the introduction of the Scotland-wide register. And indeed, the, the lack of statutory regulation for such individuals has, in the past, proved on occasion controversial. But again, the key to this will be in the proper resourcing and administration of this to seek maximum effectiveness in the interests of children, their parents and families. What about the possible increase in costs related to family contact centres already mentioned? Measures relating to that are notable in their absence from the bill, and so I look forward to further government clarification on this point regarding funding and explanation of how the resourcing issues which I and others have identified will be addressed going forward. And indeed, if necessary, by amendments being brought forward and approved at stage two. And with that, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. Phil McGregor, followed by Alec Rowley. Um, thank you, President Officer, and uh, can I start by um, giving my thanks to those that uh, attended the Justice Committee and, of course, the Clerks and Justice Committee for the tremendous amount of work uh, that they've put into this. Um, President Officer, today I speak in this debate as not only a member of the Justice Committee, uh, but also as a dad of uh, two children myself. And it's actually my son's uh, third birthday today. Not uncommon for parents to be working on their uh, kids' birthday, but it's a wee bit different this year, I think, folk will understand he's also not got any uh, grandparents or other uh, family around. So I hope that the Chamber, yourself and the Chamber, will forgive me for taking the opportunity to wish him happy birthday on the official record. <laughs> so, happy birthday, Rune. Happy birthday, Rune McGregor. And um, I'm just getting reminded here to say his name. And uh, no doubt he'll be mortified uh, when I show him in years to come. Um, but uh, moving on to the bill, President Officer, thank you for that. Um, it's, it, it's a very good bill, and it, I'm, I'm glad to say it's been um, very much welcomed across the board, as I think you've heard today, both in the political uh, world, but also in the, the evidence that we heard. Uh, and I think that the consensus is it's a good bill, and actually the discussion around more about points where it could be improved rather than the, the principles of it, as we're, as we're obviously hearing. Um, and we've heard from um, the children's organisations, NSPCC, Children's First, um, Women's Aid and others. Um, and I think it d does bring about some uh, quite important changes. We heard from John Finney about the, the vulnerable witnesses, uh, protection for vulnerable witnesses moving uh, on from the Vulnerable Witnesses Scotland Bill, which was passed um, uh, in here a year or so ago, uh, in the Barna House model that we, that we had a lot of discussion around. Um, there's also been a lot of uh, discussion, probably one of the most um, contentious areas, if you could call it that, um, in taking evidence was around uh, child contact centres um, and we did hear the varying degrees of evidence. We heard good evidence, um, evidence sorry, of good practice uh, in contact centres but also um, some concerns raised particularly as others have said uh, for example by uh, Women's Aid and around uh, the issue of domestic violence. So I do welcome uh, the, uh, the, the Minister's response to the committee's report and recommendations on that and, and look forward to hearing more ahead of stage two um, particularly around some of the uh, how, we can, how we can improve the communication there between the courts and contact centres. Um, obviously, the key one is hearing views of younger children. Uh, this is a must. You know, we've really got to do this to get it, to get it right. Um, an absolute no-brainer no uh, in my mind. I think that um, the, the register of who can be appointed uh, as a, a welfare um, officer, I think, is, is very welcome indeed. Um, I declare an interest as a, a registered social worker and, uh, and I remember a time when social workers were uh, doing more of these. It, it does seem to be the case, as the Minister said, it's mainly uh, the legal profession now, but I think that um, you know, uh, it, it would be good to um, have a wider, a, a wider sphere. Uh, and, and you know, I think with the case with social workers and psychologists, the child would be the centre and I think we've got to make sure that that's the case uh, and that would be the, the main um, interview. Um, in any process. And I also welcome um, the support and advocacy workers' um, suggestion made, particularly by Women's Aid and others. I, I hear what the Minister is saying, but it is an area that, uh, that I've got an interest in. I think that 
it would offer a lot to the um, to, to this debate, but whether it needs to be done in legislation or we can do it through the existing frameworks, I, I'm, I'm very open-minded to that. Um, the issue around sibling contact, uh, looked after and accommodated children, uh, I agree with all the points made in that. I think this is absolutely crucial. Some of the evidence we've heard, as, as you've heard already, has been um, mind-blowing, to say the least. But uh, I do agree with what the Minister has said in, in, in referring to uh, Marie Todd also. Um, th this should be being done. And I, I can't actually imagine a situation, and I've said this at committee, and Liam Kerr, for example, I'm looking over him because he, he knows that I've said this um, on several occasions. I can't actually imagine a situation where this wouldn't be done. Um, there is the looked after and accommodated process in place, and there's a children's hearing uh, in place as well. So I, I would like to think that that has always been done. And if it's not, then, um, you know, is that a down to resources? And I would ask the Minister um, to perhaps um, have a wee look at that. That's a wee sip of water, uh, President Officer. My apologies for that. Um, other areas that I think that are, are quite important um, as well that have been raised, for example, by um, the Shared Parent in Scotland, and I should also uh, say that I'm the convener of that cross-party group, and they've, they've brought forward um, some suggestions for um, amendments uh, as well as general debating points. Um, I do agree uh, with Liam Kerr. He didn't, um, he didn't um, misquote me when he talked about the concerns that I've got about around um, the residence uh, and contact terms. I, I don't think that they're helpful. Um, I, I can speak as a social worker and many other social workers many times that we would um, get into trouble, if you like, for, for want of a better word, when we are, are using just um, the language of the profession, if you like, and we, we maybe inadvertently say contact to a child, and you know the child's reaction is quite often contact. What? That's my mum, my dad, what we're talking about, you know. Uh, I think we do need to, to listen to that. But again, whether that needs to be in, on the face of the bill or whether it's about guidance um, out to um, local authorities and uh, workers across the board. Uh, certainly, we were all always discouraged from using it, but because it is the actual legal term, you sometimes just get into that um, kind of uh, process. So, again, I'm quite open-minded to that. Um, grandparents, um, uh, again, there's a um, suggestion that there, there could be a, a, an amendment put in um, a, a, to include grandparents and other relatives. I think that we're all, especially uh, parents just now, are experiencing the the loss of not having uh, con um, you know, uh, contact with our grandparents and, uh, and the impact that that's having on our children. So I do think that that is something that we need to look at uh, in the round. And perhaps grandparents often feel that they are, they are a vital relationship to that child uh, and the child uh, has a vital relationship to them. And perhaps they, um, I, I can see you asked me to wind up, but I'll wind up on this point, uh, presiding officer, that, that um, perhaps they, they often uh, lose that contact and the child loses the contact with them as a result of perhaps uh, the, the parents' um, actions. And, uh, and again, I welcome what the Minister said there on the Charter, that perhaps you could bring forward uh, before Stage 3 uh, some more um, you know, detail on, on, on what that will include. And um, I had some, so much more to say, President Officer, but I will uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. Alec Rowley, followed by Shona Robson. Thank you, President Officer. Scottish Labour supports the general principles of the Children's Scotland Bill and welcomes the progress it marks in the promotion and production of children's rights as are set out in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Scottish Labour affirms the need to place the best interests of the child at the heart of decisions affecting them and agrees that supporting children's participation in these decisions is essential. We welcome the protection that these new provisions afford to vulnerable persons in Section 11 parent and dispute cases and believe that consistency in the treatment of vulnerable witnesses should be facilitated across all legal proceedings. There are a number of concerns about the current safety of child contact centres, as others have said, and so regulation is a necessary step but the Scottish Government must ensure that centres have sufficient funding to meet demand and any new regulatory requirements. Scottish Women's Aid have written about the role of the Children's Scotland Bill must play in protecting women, children and young people who have experienced domestic violence. The key points they raise are children who have experienced domestic abuse are at the centre of the majority of family court cases and also the most vulnerable parties in them. 
The government has an obligation to create a system that protects and upholds their rights. Omitting children's views from proceedings is disempowering and dangerous. The bill must be amended to ensure meaningful participation, including a child-friendly system of redress and complaint. Children have consistently stressed that the importance of support and advocacy workers. The bill must be amended to reflect the Scottish Government's commitment to providing specialist trauma-informed support and facilitating children's meaningful participation. Children who have experienced domestic abuse must be able to express their views safely without fear of retribution. The bill must be amended to provide further protection for children's confidentiality. Understanding of the dynamics of abuse and control must be reflected at every stage of civil court processes, including in the language used to describe it, the training of legal professionals, the provision of special measures for vulnerable witnesses, and referrals to contact centres. Many organisations have written on a similar point to those of Women's Aid. Although the bill is an important step forward, there remains areas that Scottish Labour wishes to see addressed and tightened up at stage two. These include the provision enhancing the right of the child to express a view during proceedings that are positive. However, there are a number of additions that could improve this further still. There was some concern that as drafted, simply removing the presumption of competency for over 12s could mean more children are deemed to fall into the exception of not having capacity and fewer children will actually have their views considered. To counter this, as James Kelly said, the legislation could be strengthened to include an explicit requirement that the court ensure a child, regardless of age, has the opportunity to express their views. Provision could also be made for a child to refuse to make their views known so that they are not placed under pressure to make what may feel like a decision or a choice. Children should also be given the opportunity to indicate the manner in which they wish to express their views rather than what is considered suitable, being mandated to them. Although the bill removes the age limit presumption with regard to expression of view, it retains the presumption in the 1995 Act that children aged 12 and over should have capacity to instruct a solicitor. This is inconsistent with the approach of the bill and the presumption in relation to legal capacity already exists elsewhere in other legislation. This section should therefore be removed. The Scottish Government has indicated to the Justice Committee its intention to do so. The section on the duty to investigate non-compliance with contact orders was subject to some debate, namely as to whether it adds anything to the existing practice. However, as the provision currently stands, there is no explicit provision for the child's view to be sought, and this should be rectified if the provision remains. As I stated previously, presiding officer, there is a broad support for this bill across all organisations in Scotland who work with children and families, and there are positive views being submitted on how to improve the bill even further, including the excellent report from the committee. So I look forward to stage two, presiding officer. Thank you. Colin Shurner Robson to be followed by Donald Cameron. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to oh, speak in uh, support of the general principles of this bill and start, as others have, with thanking the uh, Justice Committee clerks and indeed the, the witnesses who provided very powerful and important evidence. Um, the bill will substantially amend the law which applies when parents are in dispute with each other over some aspect of their children's lives and like others I think we can all think of constituency cases where we've had issues um, concerning uh, disputes that have impacted very much on the children 
concerned. Um, after parents separate or divorce, disputes can arise about where a child should live and the arrangements for a parent to have contact with a child that, that he or she does not live with. And of course, the key thing that the, the bill proposes at sections one to three are changes to help children participate in decisions about them, including uh, court decisions. And I think Rona Mackay put it very well when she said that the overarching thing this bill does is to give children a voice. And of course, a key aim is to encourage the courts to hear the views of younger children uh, before reaching a decision. The bill also proposes, of course, a statutory regulation of several key aspects of what could be called the machinery associated with the 1995 Act. This includes child welfare reporters and child contact centres, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second. And of course, the bill aims to improve uh, the experience of vulnerable people in the courtroom in family cases such as those affected by domestic abuse. Uh, the Justice Committee, um, in looking at the, the bill in great detail, um, made a number of recommendations uh, in its report. Overall, the committee considers that the bill is a positive step forward in achieving the, the policy aims. Um, it very much welcomed the removal of the existing presumption in the 1995 Act that a child aged 12 or over uh, is of a sufficient age and maturity to form a view, having heard consistent evidence that the presumption has meant that the views of younger children are not routinely heard in practice. The committee asked the Scottish Government to respond to the concerns raised by various stakeholders that the current drafting of the bill does not go far enough in ensuring that the views of all children, particularly younger children, are heard. The committee also supports provisions in the bill which would regulate child contact centres, which I think is very important given some of the evidence we heard about the different uh, practices, some of uh, concerns about uh, quality of provision and bringing a standardisation and regulation to that I think is very important. That does of course raise the issue of significant costs potentially for uh, contact centres and meeting the new regulatory re requirements. Um, so uh, the committee asked the Scottish Government to provide details on how it will ensure that sufficient funding is made available for contact centres uh, for their existing level of provision, but also in terms of the new regulatory uh, requirements. And I would want to welcome the Scottish Government's response to the, the, the report, the committee's report um, so far. So the issue of, of children's participation and decisions affecting them, um, the Justice Committee asked the Scottish Government to bring forward amendments at stage two to address the concerns expressed uh, to the committee and ensure the views of all children, regardless of age, are heard. And I welcome the Scottish Government response in recognising the concerns raised by the committee and indeed many stakeholders during uh, the stage one oral and written evidence about the risks that the provisions could be misinterpreted and lead to decision makers deciding a child does not have capacity to give their views. And uh, I welcome the Scottish Government accepts that the recommendations and proposes to uh, bring forward an amendment at stage two, strengthening the provision in sections one to three of the bill to avoid, if possible, the risk of the capacity exemption being used excessively by uh, decision makers. In terms of the regulation of child contact centres, uh, as I said earlier, this has been uh, uh, an issue uh, that has been looked at in some detail. The vast majority of stakeholders agreed that they should uh, indeed be regulated, and I said earlier why, why that was, um, to um, ensure a consistent, more consistency, the quality of provision. However, the issue of funding uh, issues has arisen and of course I welcome like others have the, the fact the Scottish Government uh, gave interim funding which provide a level of, uh, provided a level of stability uh, to uh, contact centres. Uh, however I do welcome the commitment to provide further uh, details before uh, the first stage two session on funding for contact centre, centres for both the existing service and, of course, importantly, any new regulatory requirements arising from this bill, which I think we all agree there uh, will be. Um, an issue raised by Scottish Women's Aid and the committee agreed with was, where possible, the approach to children and vulnerable individuals is the same across all criminal and civil proceedings, include children's hearings. And I welcome the Scottish Government accepting this recommendation, albeit 
through a longer term piece of work. Uh, some of this I understand is already underway or will be underway through the Victims Task Force. I think that this shows um, that the government has been listening to many of the issues raised uh, during the stage one process. I look forward to stage two where this very important bill uh, can be improved uh, further still and I give it my support, the general principles, my support today. Thank you very much. I now call Donald Cameron to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by referring to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates, which is a body I'm aware gave evidence to the Justice Committee uh, on this bill. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to uh, this important legislation at stage one and thank those on the Justice Committee for their scrutiny of this bill so far and also for their very helpful report. I've listened carefully to the comments made by many across the chamber this afternoon. As uh, has been noted by others, this bill seeks to enact changes to the landmark 1995 Act and also the subsequent uh, Family Law Scotland Act 2006 in order to meet new challenges that exist and to reflect the recommendations from various organisations and charities on improving the process of resolving disputes over children. The Scottish Conservatives, as Liam Kerr has said, are broadly supportive of the intent of the bill and as such we will support it as stage one with a view to making improvements uh, as it progresses at stage two. Uh, running the risk of repeating what others have said already, I will use my time to focus on two specific elements of this extensive bill and consider the views of both the Justice Committee and the organisations that have presented evidence to it. The first of these issues is children's participation. And I note the proposals in this bill to improve the participation of children in the court process, and particularly sections one to three of the bill, which seek to remove the existing presumption that only a child aged 12 or over is of sufficient age and maturity to form a view. The bill provides instead that all children who are capable and wish to do so should be able to give their views. This change was welcomed during the call for evidence by charities such as Who Cares Scotland, who added, and I quote, that the removal of the presumption must come alongside new resources and approaches to facilitate participation from those under 12 to engage meaningfully with the court process and should not result in young children being expected to fit into a system designed for adults. I also note the views of both the Justice Committee and stakeholders that the existing wording of the bill may lead to misinterpretations and therefore decision makers could come to the view that the child does not have capacity to give their views. I therefore welcome the fact that the Scottish Government will seek to address this area of concern through amendments at stage two, which will hopefully strengthen that particular provision. Section 15 of the bill is also important, as it now ensures that any decision taken by a court has to be explained to the, to the child where possible. Many courts and judges will, of course, be doing this already, but it seems important to give it statutory footing. Given that it is not currently a requirement for a court to explain decisions to children in a manner they can understand, this provision would ensure that either a court uh, would have to explain to the, the child the decision taken or do this through a child welfare reporter. And I think I note the financial memorandum for the bill suggests that in the vast majority of cases, uh, the latter method would be used. I see that the committee report highlights the view of the Children's Commissioner who noted that explaining decisions to children is an important part of the participation process. And though I recognise the concerns around this section from others, including the Faculty of Advocates, and also note that the Justice Committee recommended that the Scottish Government should set out at stage two how it will address the practical issues raised about the duty in section 15. And I again note that the Government has indicated it will so address this matter. Uh, the second uh, point of uh, my comments uh, are about the issues around a failure, a potential failure to obey a court order. And in this regard, I want to highlight section 16 of the bill, which refers to how courts should respond to the situation where one parent breaches a court order in favour of another parent or relative. And at present, parents found in contempt of court may be either fined or imprisoned, but the bill would introduce powers to investigate why a breach of a court order took place and if there are special circumstances that led to this breach. That would allow courts to, to decide if finding a parent in contempt of court would truly be 
in the child's best interest and instead consider alternative courses of action, such as adjusting uh, the court order itself. <clears throat> I note the conflicting views on this provision, including the comments, for example, from Scottish Women's Aid, who state that from their experience, women who fail to comply with contact orders are often, in reality, protecting their children from abuse and have been subject to criminal proceedings as a result. On the other hand, the senators of the College of Justice, the most senior judges in Scotland, argue that the provision is unnecessary, stating in their written evidence that the nature of contempt of court proceedings already ensures that the court must take into account the reasons for any failure to obey an order. And there is a risk, they say, that its introduction would encourage parties to disobey a court order in order to draw attention to what they perceive to be its injustice, and so indirectly seek to bring about its variation or discharge, in the view of the uh, Senators of the College of Justice. I acknowledge that the committee report uh, recommends that if this section remains, then the government should amend at stage two to make it clear that as any part of the investigation, the views of the child or children involved should be, sh should be sought where they wish to give their views. This appears in keeping with the general theme of the bill, and I welcome, again, that the government will make proposals at stage two. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is an extensive and thorough and important uh, piece of legislation, which I concur is needed to help not only change existing legislation in this area, but to comply further with the UN Convention and family court cases. As I've said, those of us on these benches are content to support the bill at stage one, but we will continue to scrutinize it at stage two. Children who end up going through the pain and stress of entering the court system as a result of parental dispute should always be at the forefront of our decision making. They come first, and while I look forward to seeing this bill progress, I would encourage anyone to make positive amendments as it goes through Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to speak in this stage one debate on the Children's Scotland Bill. It's another example of getting on with what matters, uh, even as the pandemic continues. Tempting as it is to start with the words, as a father, I don't think that would be fair, nor do any of my young scamps have a birthday today. I believe the purpose and benefits of this bill will be clear to everyone, whether or not they have had children. After all, it doesn't take a parent to understand that we must always seek to protect and nurture children in all that we do. Further enshrining children's rights and legislation to help them weather traumatic experiences is part of that. This year we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. As set out in the 2020 programme for government, the Scottish Government is stepping up its awareness raising programme for children's rights, placing them at the heart of decision making. And we seek to, cha to change to better the lives of children now and ensure those who come after us are not subjected to the same inequalities as people of older generations were. This is why Scottish ministers are so committed to the policy of getting it right for every child, giving all children the best start in life, working to close the attainment gap, having extended free child care provision and much more. And indeed, these aspirations are shared across the chamber. 2018 was Scotland's year of young people, during which their voices were heard louder than ever and their achievements celebrated. Important as it is to support children under all circumstances, it's during times of trauma or when the kids are not all right that we need to give them extra support. As we continue to learn more about the impact of adverse childhood experiences on the rest of our lives, this is increasingly recognised and must be acted upon. The Scottish Government's decision to incorporate the United Nations Convention into Scots law, making Scotland the only UK nation to do so, was the right one. Uh, and the, the Committee on the Rights of the Child considers that elements taken into account when assessing and determining the child's best interests should include their views and identity, preservation of the family environment and maintaining relations, care protection and safety, situation of vulnerability, and the right to health and education. And this is what this bill is all about. I want to elaborate on two factors that spoke to me in particular as I examined the bill, maintaining family relations and vulnerability. Regarding the former, I want to hone in on the unique relationship between siblings in particular as addressed in section 10 of the bill. This amends section 17 of the 1995 Act such that, and I quote, the local authority must take such steps to promote personal relations and direct contact between a looked after child and their siblings as appear to the local authority to be practicable and appropriate, having regard to the local authority's duty to promote the welfare of the child. Scottish ministers consider that a sibling relationship can extend beyond a biological brother or sister, and I fully support that view. 
Duties will extend to full, half, step and adopted siblings and include, include sibling-like relationships. My sister and I grew up in a home which was often very disruptive. We relied on each other and I'm convinced our shared experiences and being there for each other are a big reason we are so close now. That and because we are twins. I'm sure I speak for many when I say that being separated from my sister during childhood, for whatever reason, would have been the worst thing that could have happened to either of us. I can only begin to imagine how difficult such a loss of contact would be for, for a child who has had to be placed not with one parent after a, child, after a split, but in the care of a local authority because staying with parents was not deemed to be safe. This in itself is difficult for any child, little to be dealing with severe trauma. Adding to that, the loss of contact with a trusted sibling must lead to extra stress and feelings of isolation, not to mention exacerbated concerns about the well-being of their brother or sister. For those who don't have any sibling bonds, the facilitation of contact with grandparents may fulfil a bigger role. As such, I would like to see further details on the steps ministers intend to take to promote the charter for grandchildren during stage two. While I appreciate that asking councils to facilitate and promote sibling and grandparental contact can add extra pressures to them, both practically and financially, so we must do all we can to help councils implement this rather than just bestowing pressures upon them. I'm certain the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, the charity Stand Up for Siblings and other children's rights organisations will provide clear and workable input reflecting such needs and look forward to seeing more detail as the bill progresses through its second stage after tonight. Looking at vulnerability, I think it's important we take a moment to acknowledge that some children already live with conditions and disabilities and may also go through difficult family situations. Children's hospitals across Scotland represent children who live with life-shortening conditions and help children who may require further support to enable their participation in proceedings given their increased vulnerability. Pressures leading to difficult situations can occur in every family and children who already have other challenges to deal with are sadly not exempt from added pressures in their family life. Some children may be non-verbal or have other communication challenges, so inclusive communication means and support are crucial if we really want children's voices to be heard loud and clear. There are, of course, situations where a court may consider that a child would not be capable of understanding decisions. In light of this, I'm pleased that the bill as proposed will have a positive impact in relation to the protected characteristic of disability, as it contains provisions allowing the courts to authorise the use of special measures to protect vulnerable parties. Presiding officer, I thank the Justice Committee for looking at the proposed bill and, as always, the civil servants who worked on this piece of legislation and all others who contributed uh, so heartily to it. I look forward to voting in favour of this bill at decision time and trust that colleagues across the chamber will do likewise. Thank you very much. I call Pauline McNeill to be followed by Bob Jones. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too would like to thank the Justice Committee for their excellent work and so far many excellent speeches. I do agree with the Minister when she said in her opening speech that civil law in this Parliament is very much overshadowed. And I think this uh, debate is testament to the fact it has been overshadowed because there's really high content speeches here uh, in the stage one report, uh, which um, I'm not saying is rare, but I think it's really been high quality and I do welcome it. I also thought that perhaps the bill would be more appropriately titled children's rights rather than protection because what I've been hearing all afternoon is about how we want to broaden and protect the rights of children in relation to the reviews, which is the aim of the bill, and quite rightly too, review the 1995 legislation eh, and apply the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. Um, omitting children's views is disempowering and leads to poorer outcomes in some of the briefings that we've heard. So it's fundamental in all decision making that affects children's lives that their views must be established. And I suppose it has been an omission that we've left it so long to bring it to this point. So Scottish Labour supports the general principles of the bill and I support the removal of the existing presumption in the 95 Act that only a child aged 12 or over is of sufficient age and maturity to form a view. Although I do accept that in some cases um, courts do actually uh, seek the view of a child under the age of 12. I also agree with the committee's reports uh, that the committee report which notes that a 12 year old child is no more able to express a view than a child one day short of his or her 12th birthday. And it is concerning to read that the committee consistently heard evidence that has meant that the views of younger children have not been routinely heard in practice and therefore the removal of this nominal age is a very important step in rectifying this. If there are a couple of areas that I just thought were worthy of further exploration and the first is 
has been addressed by others is about the consistency of approach, given that there will be no age contained in the legislation. And the question is, well, how low do the courts go? Um, I, I suppose that's something the courts have to judge for themselves. How young can a child be before it's used? Obviously, it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But we need to ensure that there's consistency of approach. Otherwise, I think we'll end up with an uneven and unwanted situation. I think it's important that we seek um, to, in the bill, to ensure that seeking the actual views of the child. Um, I think it was Jamie Green who made an intervention and made this point. I think it's critical to this legislation. There is no point in changing the law if the law is not changed to such a degree that it is the views of the child which are brought forward. I say this because when I chaired the Justice Committee along with Margaret Mitchell many years ago, it, we did have a substantial appeal case, it was a well-known appeal case at the time, where it transpired that the child was sitting on the knee of the mother and had questions led by the mother in a, in a court case which led to criminal conviction. Now that would never happen now, but I think it's important to recognise that it is the views of the child that must be sought and not the parent leading the child. Otherwise, there would be no point um, in doing this. I also wanted to address the question of failure to obey an order. Now, I think this is a really important area of the legislation, notwithstanding Neil Finlay's point about the need to regulate contact centres and Donald Cameron's excellent uh, contribution to this. Uh, I want to talk about um, the women's aids uh, briefing and the issue of domestic violence. I want to talk separately from that just for a minute. I mean, I've seen up to 15 cases of parents where there's not been domestic violence involved in a case where they have not, parents, the other parent has not complied with the order. It's been going on for years and I think it's wrong and I think that what need, the ministers and the committee should do at stage two and stage three of this is fix that aspect of it otherwise because to deal with the question of what is the, in the welfare interest of the child, it must be a presumption that everyone who has previously been in their life, both parents and grandparents and siblings, or I do not think that would be in the welfare interest of the child. And I might, recall, I might be wrong in recalling this, but I'm sure that members of this parliament, including Kenny Gibson, were involved in around 2006 on the establishment of the grandparents charter because this question keeps arising whether or not you give grandparents rights or not. It's going to keep coming back until perhaps we have a presumption of the courts when making a decision about the welfare interests of the child that both parents where there's no violence involved and grandparents, siblings, are absolutely a requirement for the welfare interests of the child. I am pleased to see that one of the stated aims of the bill is to further protect victims of domestic abuse and their children. So I was particularly concerned to read that children first have said that within their services there are reports that the courts are used to continue to perpetrate domestic abuse and that children feel that no one is listening to them. And for those cases that do go to court, research published in 2012 suggests that domestic abuse is alleged in just under half, that's 47 per cent of court actions over contact. The committee heard arguments from stakeholders, including Women's Aid, and assist that given the percentage of courts affected by cases affected by allegations of domestic abuse, it's important to design the law and the court system around the most vulnerable adults. In conclusion, presiding uh, and children, I'm conclusion, presiding officer, I do think it's balancing up the interests of everyone here and recognising that we have a system here where we must protect the views of children. We must protect women and children from domestic violence, but we also must ensure that parents um, uh, are also well served by the courts when, when the views of the children are given and allowed to be given, and it's the children's views that really matter in drawing these conclusions. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Keith Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start off by thanking my constituents whose experiences of contact centres and the family court system have powerfully informed me of the need for reform. And can I start with contact centres? And in doing so, can I start with a disclaimer? There are many good contact centres, contact centres out there doing wonderful jobs, but constituents don't contact you to see contact centres have done a good job. They tell you when they've got it wrong, quite frankly. And I actually got a cluster of cases 
around one particular contact centre, which I obviously won't name. So I want to speak strongly in favour of regulation and inspection of contact centres. Let me begin with minimum standards of accommodation. Presiding officer, a constituent of mine, a father, has not seen his disabled son for three years. The most recent central reason has been no disabled toilet with a hoist. Currently no requirements uh, for there to be so, and the list of contact centres used by courts does not appear to have that compliance either, nor does it seem to take it into account. As recently as April, my constituent told me that the contact centre centre now had a disabled toilet and a hoist, but his lawyer was still trying to secure funds for a changing mat and a trade member of staff to use the hoist. That's simply ridiculous and unacceptable. So I welcome provisions uh, on, the, uh, in, on the face of the bill at section 9.3 in relation to minimum standards of accommodation, but it doesn't specifically mention disabled access, and per that, perhaps that needs to be specifically on the face of the bill within the legislation also. Nor are there requirements for courts to ensure contact centres on their list are compliant. When I contacted the Sheriff Principal, I was left in no doubt of their independence, and I get it, and I was referred back to the lawyer, but surely courts should ensure their list of contact centres are accessible by statute, not just by discretion and goodwill and independence. Uh, can the bill deal with that? Minister, I'd like to know that. And I want to make sure there's regulation of all contact centres, because if a contact centre is not mentioned on the interlocutor, it doesn't mean it shouldn't be regulated and inspected. So I think we have to look at that again as well. I want to talk about a, another case, uh, again relating to contact centres, but the robustness, the professionalism and the accuracy sometimes of reports compiled by contact centres prepared to go to the courts. Uh, they were concerned about the underlying weighting given by some courts to these reports also. Given there's no clear national standards and guidance, or indeed training for the authors of such reports, let's be fair to those actually drafting those reports, uh, that's perhaps unsurprising. When my constituent got a new contact centre appointed and that contact was observed, it transformed their experience with their child and it transformed their experience with the courts when that report went back. But in the time I've got left, actually, I want to talk about an exceptional young woman, a constituent of mine, let down by the current system. She has fought adversity to protect her son and her family. I'm not going to name her, although the minister has met that young woman. I thank her for taking the time to hear her story. Uh, but I'm going to call her Elle. She has to be called that because her life has been held, quite frankly. Um, I also want to pay tribute to Gay in my office, who has worked so closely with her and her family every step of the way. When Elle first contacted my office, she was hugely anxious that an abusive ex-partner was using the court system and her child to exercise continuing power and control over her. With the support of my office and Police Scotland, and I thank them, a conviction was secured for previous domestic abuse. Elle remained hugely worried that the courts were keen to accelerate contact between the ex-partner and her child without taking full account of all court reports. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Again, Elle was concerned that the weight placed on the contact centre report going to the courts, including concerns over its partiality, quite frankly, and inaccuracies. As was uh, seemingly ignoring the requirement in this case for an ex-partner to uh, engage with anger management in relation to that. Yes. Neil Finlay. B very briefly, he's mentioned in a scenario that was very similar to my constituent. And I just want to put on record that my constituent was forced to bring a petition before the parliament because of the way that they had to go round and round the houses, getting no answers and through the courts, getting no answers. Indeed, she was threatened with um, jail for contempt of court, for refusing to comply with an unsafe situation for her children. This is what we have to remedy in this bill. Bob Jones. Can I thank Mr Finlay for putting that on the record? And I absolutely agree with him. I hope, because I've got more testimony I want to put on the record. I know time is tight, presiding officer, but I want to get some of that on the record here this afternoon. Uh, when Elle's child was unwell, the sheriff would not accept uh, GP evidence that that was the case. Uh, only the GP would have to take the stand to accept anything else, and that wasn't possible. Elle was fined £1,000 
Some of that money went to her ex-partner as compensation. When Elle was ill uh, and it was in hospital following the birth of her new child, her new baby, which is a joy in, in her new life that she's now getting on with, she got her grandmother to take her child to the contact centre. But Elle was named on the court order to take the child to the contact centre and her ex-partner threatened her with contempt of court again, only by changing her lawyer, with 24 hours notice that appearing in court, did Elle get that dropped? She was threatened with jail from an abusive ex-partner. The reason I'm saying this, presiding officer, is those that are making the case for Section 16 to be removed are simply wrong. There are many reasons for a failure to obey an order, and the courts do not always have time to consider them. Section 16 must stay. It must be central to the provisions within this bill. Yes, if it has to be amended, absolutely, let's do that. But it must stay. It will protect people like my constituent, L. But it will also protect non-resident parents, where other people have said some people will play the system. Let's be really honest about it. Courts, and I mean sheriffs and lawyers, quite frankly, don't always look at all the reports open to them. They don't read all the paperwork. Let's just be honest about it, and it might be time constraints. Having that break in the system to inquire about why contact has not taken place is vitally important rather than threatening an abused woman, a victim with the jail for trying to protect her child. So we put that on record here this afternoon. So I don't want to make any more remarks, but I've asked for a couple of things in relation to amending the bill. And I want to be very clear about the role of reports from contact centres going to the sheriff and the weight that a sheriff should place on them. Because I think without regulation and details and consistency, that has undue influence on sheriffs, and I don't think that's acceptable, presiding officer. Thank you very much. I now call Keith Brown. Keith Brown will be the final open debate speaker in this debate. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Can I start by wishing a happy birthday to Rune McGregor? I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in support of the bill at stage one, which is uh, of particular interest to myself, although not a member of the committee, but also to many of my constituents, and is of course of great importance to many parents and children across Scotland. I think we all acknowledge that family separation is, even at the best of times, a painful and difficult process. And I think also trying to legislate on it is even more difficult in some circumstances. I have been contacted by many constituents over the years who express continued concern in the way that family law operates in Scotland. And I am also very cautious of the ability of governments to provide simple solutions for deeply complicated family situations that can often surround separation. Notwithstanding that, I think it's clear that the law and legal frameworks need updating. Now, there are fundamentally values over which there can be no disagreement. The law must protect women and children, indeed everyone, from domestic abuse and ensure that abusers do not have continued access to those they have abused. I think it's also very important that people are protected from malicious accusations of abuse. Um, these can often be used to strengthen somebody's legal position or in a vindictive way. So I welcome, as others have done today, the further measures that this bill introduces to protect abuse survivors and vulnerable witnesses. But some of my constituents believe there's a sense that the bill represents something of a missed opportunity in terms of updating the law and does not address some of the difficulties that they face. One issue is continually raised with me is that of shared parenting. And while other countries, including the Netherlands and New Zealand, have a presumption of shared parenting, we don't have that assumption here in Scotland. This can often result in what many feel to be a tiered system of parenting in which those who live with the child are able to dictate access to the parent who does not. I've recently been contacted by a constituent who alleges that her ex-partner is using the COVID-19 crisis as an excuse to prevent her from seeing her child. And while there are many legitimate reasons to reduce contact with a child, I'm sure that many here would agree that it's not reasonable that parents are able to prevent responsible ex-partners accessing their children in this manner. And attempts to address these concerns through the standard system of mediation are often not productive. Parents with residence may not attend with an adversarial court process, uh, the only remedy for parents without residence, and the conflict and financial and emotional costs that brings. Contact our orders issued by courts may not be complied with, with seemingly little recourse for parents deprived of time with their children. And I take on board the points made by Bob Doris and others about contact centres and also some of the issues that arise in terms of non-compliance with contact orders. But sometimes these things are also used uh, for one parent against another. 
And while proposed improvements to child welfare for reporters are positive, constituents, I will do yes. Bob Doris. I, I totally take on board the point Keith Brown makes. Um, we have to make sure the system is fair to all parties and really, and most importantly, for, to the child. Um, I'm not totally convinced about a presumption of shared parenting, but I wonder if we think we have to be clear on legislation that there should be a duty upon courts to consider shared parenting, and perhaps that's not up front there at the start of the process. Keith Brown. Hey. Oh, in the face of what uh, Bob Doris says, I think I would have a lot of sympathy for that idea and certainly would um, be met with approval by those that have contacted me about this. Uh, more widely, Shared Parenting, uh, an organisation which I know the Minister has met with, and I'm grateful for the fact he's met with me as well on this, has raised concerns over the lack of reform over language used in the Bill, an issue that I expect will be returned to as the Bill develops. The Bill does represent, in my view, a substantial improvement to family and law in Scotland, especially the measures to ensure the views of children uh, are more effectively heard. But it also appears that this is an opportunity to, measure, to introduce a measure of equity into our family law and to remove some of the historic inequalities that continue to overshadow it, shadow it, preventing parents from contacting and spending invaluable time with their children. Incidentally, I agree with the Minister's response to an earlier point from um, Alec Cole Hamilton about the rights of grandparents, which is very important. We've all had representations on it, but I don't think these can cut across the rights of the children or uh, sometimes even the parents. Introducing though, a presumption of shared parenting in line with many of our European neighbours, to go back to the point Bob Doris made, would help to address, although not fix of itself, many of the concerns that my constituents have raised. It is in keeping with the spirit of the Scottish Government's position on parenting, and crucially, it's in the spirit of the best interests of children. It's my view the Government is right that the best interests of the child must always be at the heart of family justice modernisation. It is their well-being and their futures that must be our priority. Ensuring that the family law system is just and fit for the challenges of the 21st century is a key part of this effort. And as I say, I'm very grateful to the Minister for being able to meet with her um, to discuss the concerns of my constituents and those organisations who have been in touch with me. And I would ask that in continuation of that collaborative spirit, the issues that I and others have raised today are considered throughout the further stages of this bill. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches and I call James Kelly. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think, actually, as Pauline McNeill pointed out, this has actually been a really high quality stage one debate. I think what members have done is they've taken the government legislation, which everybody agrees on supporting the general principles of the bill. They've taken the evidence in the stage one report and have come to the chamber this afternoon and there's been a lot of really good speeches and also good interaction, interventions and an exchange of ideas across the chamber uh, and I'm sure the Minister will have listened very carefully to that and it will inform not just the government's thinking going into stage two but also different members and different political parties and that can only add to the improval of the overall bill because as Liam, uh, sorry, uh, Liam MacArthur pointed out um, we don't want a situation where we all agree on legislation that's about improving the rights of the child and there's no point in just passing a piece of legislation that we all feel good about. It's got to actually work in practice. And I think that's where the parliamentary process uh, can play a really important role here as we move through stage two and stage three. I welcome the fact that the minister has already indicated that you know, she'll bring forward some amendments. Uh, firstly, in relation to the the, uh, addressing the, the, the presumption of 12 plus in relation to the rights of the child um, being, being taken away from the legislation, but ensuring that the, the rights of children are consistent uh, throughout all age groups. Uh, and also the issue about uh, non-compliance of uh, contact orders has also been addressed by the government. I think as we enter the, you know, another month of the pandemic, uh, the issue of delays in the court system uh, is, is ver very current. You know, when the committee took evidence on this, obviously we hadn't, we hadn't heard of COVID-19 at that point. Uh, the government have sought to address this issue through section 21 um, in the legislation. And I've said that the court have got to have regard to delays in the court system and the Adverse Act, uh, 
adverse effect that that would have on children. Uh, it might be the case that have regard to isn't strong enough, and I think that's something that you know needs further debate and perhaps amendment at stage two. I think there were a number of important contributions around the whole issue of confidentiality. I think Alec Rowley and Rona Mackay were right to emphasise the importance of children who were living in a situation where uh, there had been domestic abuse in the house. And that confidentiality has to be you know, balanced out in the, 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 the issues of domestic abuse victims has to be taken into account by the, by the courts. John Finney uh, and Liam MacArthur brought up the very important issue of alternative dispute resolution. Clearly, uh, a lot of parenting disputes end up in court. If they can be resolved out with court, that's to the benefit not only of the, the court system, but the, the individuals involved. And I thought John Finney made a really important point about legal aid, and this came up in the committee evidence that not a lot of people can't, can't afford the access to legal aid that's required. So that's something that needs to be taken on board uh, by the government. I think a big issue in the discussion this afternoon has been the whole issue around contact centres. It's run through the whole afternoon's um, contributions. And I think as a number of people have said, there are examples of good practice and good contact centres, but it's clear from members own experiences in the, the cases that have been brought to them that they have concerns around the, the operation of contact centres and therefore there is you know, a strong case for looking at regulation of contact centres in terms of the amendments. I also think that if we've got to get this legislation to work properly, uh, as I said in my opening speech, there needs to be proper financing and contact centres is an example of that with the relationship Scotland funding uh, had, had initially been uh, withdrawn. Another example is proper support and funding for child welfare reporters, which was raised by uh, Margaret Mitchell in her opening contribution. There's been a lot of lobbying of MSPs um, on behalf of grandparents looking for a presumption for grandparents' rights in the legislation. And we heard the um, intervention from Alec uh, Cole Hamilton. Uh, I think as Pauline McNeill pointed out, it's important that, uh, that it's the rights of the child that are central in this legislation. You know, I think Kenny Gibson is right to point out that the importance of more promotion of the Grandparents Charter is perhaps uh, a way forward. Uh, have I got time? Briefly, yeah. okay. Pauline McNeill. Yeah, Thank you very much. Um, I just wondered if, uh, if James Kelly thought it may be very important for the government to do a wee bit more work on the issue of grandparents. Anecdotally, in the work that I've done previously, what concerned me was that the grandparents who weren't having contact were on the side of the family who didn't have residency. And if that was a recurring theme, did the member agree that perhaps ministers should look at that more closely? James Kelly. Thank Pauline McNeill for that uh, intervention. I mean, I think that where the government have drafted the legislation is to emphasize the rights of the child. And I, I think that is correct. However, there are clearly, bearing in mind the number of um, c contributions that have been made on this and the number of um, the amount of correspondence. There are clearly issues around grandparents' rights, and I think it is something that the government does need to examine closely. Summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, we support the general principles of the bill. I think this is a good start, um, but I think with a bit more work, you know, we can produce a bill that serves the rights of the children properly. Thank you very much. I now call Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank all members for their very thoughtful contributions today? Um, as Kenny Gibson said, it's good to see the Chairman res resume some form of normality uh, in, in looking at really important and quite sombre legislation. Um, I think Rona Mackay really opened up uh, her comments with something that, that sticks in my mind as, as why this is so important, is that this bill and the debate we're having around it is that it finally gives children a voice in a system which is designed to listen to adults. 
And I think that really perfectly sums up the premise of the bill itself, what it's about, why it's necessary, but also what should lie at the heart of the debate around it. Polly, Polly McNeil backed it up by saying that we talk about child protection, but actually we're talking about children's rights at the same time. And by revising a 25-year-old piece of legislation, well, much has happened in those 25 years. And the focus on giving children a voice is clearly much more prominent in the, the conversation. But I would say also that everyone has a voice. The children themselves, uh, unmarried fathers, siblings, grandparents, uh, third-party agencies uh, who've been in touch with us, but also the law has a voice. And custody itself is complex. It is not as simple as a matter as perhaps when the original act was presented of two parents fighting over access or custody. These days, no two families are alike. And therefore, that balance between consistency in the application of the law, but flexibility, will be a permanent theme that recurs. Uh, just turning to some of the comments uh, that were made today, um, the minister started by talking about the consultation process. And I was quite struck by this because she mentioned the sheer scale of engagement from children, young pe people themselves, in that consultation progress. And I think that's progress for Parliament to include uh, young people at that stage of the bill so early to, to, to allow us to make informed decisions. But also, as we include uh, wider voices uh, in this legislation, including the diversity uh, into younger children uh, and listening to their place in this, it is difficult. But the tone of this debate has been good because it feels more inclusive and it feels that this legislation will be more inclusive. The issue of, uh, I raised an intervention on how we do listen to children's voices, but do so in a context that protects them from coercion uh, from either parent. And I think that's important. I, I'm, I'm, I welcome the, the, the response that the minister gave that child welfare reporters will receive more training on this issue to spot this behavior. But that, as other members have raised, that requires resource, requires training. And that's a theme that has cropped up a few times uh, in this debate. It's all very well legislating for something, but the financial memorandum needs to back it up with resource. If contact centres are not fulfilling their obligations because they don't have the infrastructure that they need to deliver for the people that use them, then there is a problem. And this is an opportunity here to fix that in legislation or otherwise. Uh, many people raise the issue of grandparents. Um, and I can speak personally because I know that when my parents were shouting and bawling each other. It was my grandmother who I often went to visit because that was a safe space uh, for me. And the same is true of many children across Scotland even today. Um, the balancing that need of the rights of grandparents, just as we balance the rights of siblings or one or the other parent or any other uh, relationship that child has, is tremendously difficult. But we have to strike that balance uh, as we go through this process. Um, the experiences that Bob Doris shared, I think, for me, put a human face to a lot of this, what was largely technical legislation. The anecdotal stories he gave us about the realities of shared parenting, um, I think are very forceful arguments around his support for Section 16. I know that those in the committee, in the chamber, and those virtually will have been listening uh, to those uh, stories. Uh, yes, I, I do, in, in a second. Uh, I think it reminds us how complex Blanket regulation cannot and does not always address the needs of individual circumstances. And again, that is a difficult balance. I give way to the member. Polly McNeill. Thank you for giving way. Um, same question I'd, uh, put to James Kelly. I mean, if it was shown, and I don't know the answer to this, but if it was shown that more grandparents from the side of the family that don't have residency were not getting contact with their grandchildren, do you think that suggests there might be something wrong that needs to be fixed? Jamie Green. Well, absolutely. I mean, just, just as children are on the receiving end of two adults who are disputing, it's no fault of the child. It's equally no fault of, of the, the grandparents who, who, are, are, you know, who are in the middle of this, this dispute. Whether or not law itself can legislate to meet those needs, I'm not sure uh, how that's possible in every case. And I think Liam Kerr touched on that. I, I, I know that that's something that the committee will look carefully at at stage two, and we'll look at it in a, a positive and open mind. But it does throw up uh, that issue that, that the legislation cannot take into account every scenario, 
and by apportioning rights to grandparents or siblings, does that detract from the rights of any other party in this discussion? These are complex disputes and negotiations often. But as Gordon uh, Linhar said, it's the judge who has that freedom and independence to make a decision on the evidence that is presented to him. Uh, I wish I had more time. I, I thought I would, I would struggle for content because I'm not on the committee, but there's so much was said today. Um, I think the issue of mediation and early resolution is really important. It is always better that we don't get to court uh, in these matters. Signposting is not always good enough for many parents. But mandatory mediation, uh, it, there were suggestions that could be piloted. It seems sensible, but it may not always be appropriate, especially in the circumstances of domestic abuse. Uh, just in closing, some of the other issues that were raised around confidentiality, sharing information, uh, around uh, that conflict of interest uh, between parents around Section 10 and, 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 and weakening of language around rights of siblings, uh, I think are all very valid technical points to be debated at stage two. But let's not forget that James Kelly's comment said that it is important that in a dispute between parents, it is the children who are at the centre of this, it is the children that are caught in the middle of all of this. I'd like to wish happy birthday to Philip McGregor's son. I promise not to sing. But he made an important point that his own experiences as a social worker remind us that disputes are legal, but they're also human. People are at the heart of law, and people should be at the heart of this legislation, even little people. And on that, I close my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call on Ash Denham to wind up the debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm very grateful to the members who have contributed to the debate this afternoon on this bill, and I would also agree with Pauline McNeill about the quality of the speeches that we've heard here this afternoon. I think one of the key points from this debate is that the bill is only one part of the way uh, and the work on reforming family courts, um, but I would also note, as others have, that um, Rona Mackay summed it up very well when she said that this bill gives children a voice. So I'm very pleased that this debate has um, shown so much consensus across the chamber. Um, agreed that this bill is a step forward and I'm glad for the support for the general principles and I've listened very carefully to the many um, detailed issues that have been raised today. I'll address as many as I can in the, the rest of the time that I have available. But I'd also like to reiterate to the chamber that I am always happy to look at any proposals that will improve the bill. So on the issue of looked after children and the duties around siblings um, funding, and that was raised by a number of members, including Liam Kerr and um, James Kelly, I want to reiterate on this that we want to see these duties implemented. We are, as a government, absolutely determined to make progress on this, and we will work with local authorities and with other partners to assist in that implementation. And um, as in my intervention earlier on to Liam Kerr, my view is that the Kerr report review reassures us all that the money is in the system. It is the way that the money is being spent that possibly is the issue here. Now, the First Minister has committed the government and local authorities to work with all focus to make the Kerr review changes as fast and as safely as possible. And so I am determined that we will see progress on this. On the issue that was raised a number of times as well, on the use of the word practicable, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to say to the Chamber that I am listening on this point and I will take the opportunity to consider this further ahead of stage two. Contact centres, so that was a theme that ran throughout the debate this afternoon. It was raised by Margaret Mitchell, James Kelly, Rona Mackay and Bob Doris, who gave some anecdotes um, from contact centres that he's had constituency cases about. I appreciate the comments that members have made about contact centre regulation and I'm, I'm sure the whole chamber will agree that in all cases contact has to be safe for the child concerned and it has to be in the child's best interest. The chamber will agree that minimum standards in relation to training and accommodation will help to ensure that all contact centres are safe locations for children. Um, I accept the suggestions from members that regulation should cover um, solicitor referrals, I think Bob Doris uh, made that point, and self-referrals. Um, I do agree with this. However, um, it's not possible um, as there's no obvious sanction for the lawyers um, or individuals in not ordering contact to a regulated centre. So I will hope to do all I can to encourage um, regulated centres to be used for self-referrals and for solicitor referrals as well. 
Funding of contact centres was raised and the Chamber will recognise the need for a sustainable funding um, arrangement to be in place. Um, currently, the Scottish Government does provide funding to Relationship Scotland and they are the organisation that run the majority of contact centres across Scotland. And as set out in the financial memorandum, um, we will provide funding to cover the additional costs um, involved in regulation. Members may also be aware that Relationship Scotland funding from the big lottery, that came to an end in March. And consequently, Scottish Government have provided an interim um, grant to them and an assurance as well that an appropriate level of funding will be made available for contact centre services um, up to the 31st of March, and that's next year. Um, I will. Jamie Green. Can I thank the Minister for taking a brief intervention? Um, if the Minister is receiving anecdotal evidence, of we have, as we have done today, of contact centres that are not working quite simply for those that they need to work for, uh, will the Minister look at, at her agencies to intervene in those places and make sure that they do fulfil their necessary obligations? Ash Denham. Well, of course, that's why it's in the bill that we are going to appoint a body to oversee the regulation of them. So the member makes a point and that is dealt with um, in, in the bill. Confidentiality was another issue that was raised by, um, by Liam Kerr and also by others. I'm very sympathetic to this issue. Um, I think, as the Chamber will recognise, um, there are competing rights here. Um, they need to be balanced. Um, that being said, I am considering an amendment at stage two um, of the bill um, that in cases under section 11 of the 95 Act, where the court is considering whether to disclose confidential documents, the welfare of the child who provided those confidential documents should be a primary consideration. Margaret Mitchell raised the issue of the government response to the Care Inspectorate's feasibility study, so just to um, say that I will endeavour to prepare a detailed response to the committee in advance of stage two. However, I would say that we're having to work, obviously, with the Care Inspectorate in order to do that, and the Care Inspectorate at the moment are very um, taken up with the COVID-19 response. So if there are any more delays to that, I will um, let the committee know forthwith. Um, grandparents, that was an issue that came up repeatedly across the chamber. Um, if I have time. Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm very grateful and just want to uh, ask this to make sure that we get it in before time, although I appreciate the grandparents' point is very important as well. Um, I asked in my contribution for reasons why I should revise my preliminary view that section 16 might not be needed. Bob Doris took me up on that and spoke extremely persuasively and powerfully. Um, so I wonder, would the minister take this opportunity to encourage those who gave the opposite view to the committee to respond to that evidence before stage two, if they remain unpersuaded? I would, coming, I would, and I'm coming on to section 16 in a moment because it was raised um, several times during the debate. So in terms of grandparents, um, a number of speakers asked me to um, explain a little bit more about what I'll be doing to further promote the Charter for Grandchildren, um, Margaret Mitchell, Fulton McGregor, Fulton McGregor rather, and Kenny Gibson are among those that mentioned it. So one of the actions of the Family Justice Modernisation um, Strategy is to, to promote it, and a key aim of that is to ensure that bodies um, such as local authorities, Social Work Scotland, and bodies representing family lawyers are fully aware of the Charter. I'm going to write specifically to those key bodies to draw attention to the Charter. Um, I also intend, if the bill is passed, to issue circulars implementing the legislation and on related matters, and we will ensure that one of the circulars um, relates specifically to the Charter. Um, I'm also going to ensure that information on the Charter is more prominent on the Scottish Government's website as well, which is mygov.scot and other um, associated platforms. And I'm going to commit to engage with the key stakeholders, such as grandparents apart, who I have met previously, but I'd be um, happy to meet them again on any steps that they think that the government could take to raise awareness for this even further. Um, in terms of non-compliance, um, which is the section 16, which has just been raised by um, Liam Kerr again, it was raised by a number of speakers. Um, I'm aware from the consultation events and responses to the consultation, um, this is a really complex area. I think the chamber would, would accept that. We've heard concerns from resident parents that they're not complying with the orders due to fears for safety. And we've heard um, stories from non-resident parents um, that they are raising concerns that resident parents are deliberately um, not complying with court orders um, without a good reason. So I'm also aware of concerns by the judiciary um, that in some cases they are already investigating non-compliance. However, I think the provisions in the bill are extremely important as they will create consistency across Scotland on this very important issue. And that in every case where non-compliance with an order is raised, that this will then be investigated either by the court or by a child's um, support, uh, welfare reporter. And that the child's views will also be sought during that. 
um, process. And I hope the Chamber would agree that that is um, progress on that issue. So um, in conclusion, presiding officer, throughout the development of this bill, the conversations that I had with children who had gone through the family court system and their descriptions uh, of what had happened to them, how it had impacted on their lives and how they felt that the system had let them down stayed with me. It impacted upon me very deeply and their experience guided me. So I wanted the bill to put the voice of the child concerned at the very heart of the process. I wanted the bill to further protect victims of domestic abuse and their families. I wanted more information on what to expect to be available. I wanted important decisions to be communicated in simple language to the children involved. And I wanted children's welfare to be paramount. And I also wanted that consistency to be right across the whole of Scotland so that a child in Galashiels could expect exactly the same as a child in Inverness. And I hope the Chamber will agree that I've achieved those aims. One girl told me, I have a voice and I want to have a say in the decisions that affect my life, but no one is listening to me. This bill aims to change that. If this is passed at stage one this evening, it sets out to ensure that the experiences shared with me by those children will not be the experience of a new generation of young people going through the family court system. Presiding officer, I commend the motion to the parliament. That concludes the stage one debate on the Children's Scotland Bill and we'll move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of motion 20712 in the name of Kate Forbes on a financial resolution for the Children's Scotland Bill and I invite Ash Denham to move the motion. Formally moved. The question in this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 21847 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on Graham Day to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. No member has asked to speak on the motion. The question is therefore that motion 21847 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 21848 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the stage one timetable for a bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Graham Day to move the motion. Moved, presiding officer. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 21848 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 21849 on approval of an SSI. And I ask Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion. Moved, presiding officer. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. To which we now come. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 21834 in the name of Ash Denham on the Children's Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is therefore agreed and the motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 20712 in the name of Kate Forbes on the Children's Scotland Bill financial resolution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The final question today is that motion 21849 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on motion number 21849 in the name of Graham Day is yes, 47, no, zero. And there were 11 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and that concludes decision time. This meeting is closed.